expecting him to come this way. Sorry, I just didn't have my head up. No, oh, no, I, I. No, it was so fast. I was expecting to come this way. I, you know, uh, certainly, I was looking down, and there, you know, I just heard some noise on this end. That, uh, I mean, I did get a shot of him once I stopped and zoomed in. You know, I had my hand over the camera ready to pull the power, and then when I saw him, this way I turned the camera, and then my hand was away from it. <laughs> That's all right. I, I think it was better off that we stopped. Uh -huh. If I would have walked up, I would have missed uh, I would have missed him. Yeah. So at least uh, when we stopped, I was able to zoom in and get a shot of him. You're here. Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. Yeah. Are you here for Austin? Yeah. He just walked in. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, but he never sent me a text message, so I just figured I'd come by and see. Yeah, he is. Maybe five minutes ago. Uh, uh, you're hearing with General Austin. How do you think the Senate will How long do you think it would take to mark up the confirmation hearing of General Austin? Well, we're going to find out. Uh, we have good, really good attendance, so I'd say it would take a couple hours. What do you think? It depends on if we, how many we have in person, because we have to have an in-person quorum. 
How yeah. how soon do you think the Senate would be able to get a floor vote on General Austin? Oh, I haven't talked to the leaders yet on that. And then, do you think President Trump uh, committed impeachable offenses no, at all? No, I don't want to comment on that. Thank you very much. Jack, just try to come over with yeah, the camera. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it surprised us all. I was Especially with all the security. Yeah. You think they just dropped them? That would be the easiest to drop yeah. them right there. You know what, though? I should have thought of it, though, because I came up to that door first, tried to open it, and it was all locked. It should have occurred to me. Oh, you actually walked. Oh, no, he I actually. Tried to walk he up came in from the, from the left. Oh. He must have come in by well, the know, elevators. I bet, yeah. like, a garage situation. Gosh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I bet that. Maybe that's what it was. Because they obviously didn't drop them there. Yeah. They must have they dropped them from Hart Building. Yeah, I don't know where. You know. Did you guys even get any coming through those doors? And they're like all locked. Yeah, they've been locked for a while. Mm -hmm. Did you guys even get any footage of them? Or yeah, yeah, it was good. Okay. All right. It was a brief two, three seconds, but slow down, and it's, he's there. <laughs>
Yes, I am. I am. Thank you. Senator, how long, how do you think the Senate should navigate a potential impeachment trial? My, my, focus, is, my focus is confirmation and COVID relief. The leadership will make a call about that. One more, uh, Senator Cain, mm -hmm. just one more. Thing. Senator Hawley today is saying that he is going to try and block a quick nomination at DNI. Do you see that as uh, as passing muster in the Senate? Um, I doubt he'll be successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to wait for a trial. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal. Yeah. How optimistic are you on President Biden having a team in place just after he's inaugurated? Do you think we're going to get quick votes? I think there will be quick votes. The country wants us to come together. They want a team in place, and it's desperately important that we have a team in place. And uh, Senator Hawley is talking about standing in the way of at least one of these nominees and, and uh, asking that there not be quick consideration. Do you think that's going to carry any influence? I think Senator Hawley's influence is at an all-time low, even within his own Republican ranks. I think it really would be disgraceful and shameful, but unfortunately, Senator Hawley is marching to his own drummer. How should the Senate navigate uh, confirming Biden's cabinet picks and also a potential impeachment trial? We can do both at the same time. The impeachment, the impeachment trial has evidence that's open and shut. It can be done very expeditiously, and it can be done at the same time as we confirm the cabinet and move forward on legislative proposal. How long do you think an impeachment trial would take? Um, I hesitate as a former trial lawyer to predict the amount of time of any trial, but I think in a matter of less than a week, certainly, a matter of days. And any reacts to you know, the, the evidence is really primarily the evidence primarily is out of Donald Trump's own mouth, his own words, recorded as a matter of public record, and what he tweeted before and said after, indicating profoundly guilty intent to incite a riot and an armed insurrection, an act of domestic terrorism. There is no question about what he intended and what happened as a result of his own words. And then any reaction to uh, two Army National Guard members being removed uh, for during the security vetting process? Rightfully, the vetting process is thorough and intensive, and any doubt resolved in favor of removing do you feel, any member of the security force. What do you make of the security presence on the Capitol? Do you feel safe during the, for the inauguration? Let me say about the removal of those National Guardsmen, we know there's a problem with white supremacists and violent extremists in the military. That's why I've asked for an Inspector General investigation and why, after I did so, the military moved forward with it. I'm sorry? Do you think it says anything that President Trump won't be at tomorrow's inauguration? It's in keeping with his really abnegation of responsibility and authority. He's really never been a responsible president, and it certainly is consistent with his approach to the job. Thank you, Judge. navigate a potential impeachment trial with confirming Biden's cabinet? Oh, I think we're trying to work all that out now. That's, I thought it was him too. Mm -hmm. They have the same kind of body type. Okay.
and a warm welcome to Charlene, your wife of more than 41 years. Now, my wife and I were 61 years. Think you'll make it? <laughs> All right. We uh, uh, are very happy, Mr. Austin, you'll be introduced now by Senator Sullivan, a member of our committee, Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The last time we were together as senators, our capital was under siege. America's authoritarian rivals abroad have been gloating about our disunity. Democracy brings chaos, they tell their people. Better to have a strong hand that keeps order. We live in an imperfect democracy, no doubt. In the American, I am proud and honored to introduce Mr. Lloyd Austin, understands our imperfections more than many. But on closer inspection, the world's dictators have little to celebrate. Congress went back to work on January 6 to count electoral college votes. Tomorrow there will be a transfer of power at the top of our government as there has been since the founding of our republic. At some point, Chinese and Russian citizens will ask, why can't we do that? Why don't we have strong, resilient institutions that ensure the regular election of new leaders and vest self-government in the people? When these questions are asked, authoritarians like Xi Jinping and Putin won't be gloating anymore because they don't have answers. What does this all have to do with Lloyd Austin? A lot. Mr. Austin has been nominated to lead one of America's most trusted institutions, the Department of Defense. Many of us have worked hard to rebuild our military, but we can all agree that there has been too much turmoil at the top. As its civilian leader, I am confident that Mr. Austin will bring steadiness, leadership, and respect to this indispensable institution. I got to know Mr. Austin in 2005 and 2006, serving together in an Army Heavy Combatant Command, conducting combat operations throughout the Middle East, we had what might be described today as an uneven power relationship. He was a two-star general, I was a major. He had spent decades on active duty, I was a reservist. He was a soldier, I was a Marine. I was just one of hundreds of field-grade infantry officers recalled to active duty, deployed in the region during a challenging time for our nation. But when I asked for his help, Mr. Austin gave it. When I had a problem, he listened. And when I asked for guidance on an important mission, he provided it. A critical hallmark of exceptional leadership, especially for organizations like the Pentagon, is not just how one treats superiors, but how one treats subordinates. What I saw was respect, integrity, and someone who gets things done in a difficult environment. It is clear to me that the core principles of Mr. Austin's life have been duty, honor, country. That may sound quaint to some, but I think having individuals of impeccable character at the top of our government is more important than ever. Other than integrity, there's no singular requirement for the difficult job of Secretary of Defense. But as the former director of the Joint Staff and CENTCOM commander, Mr. Austin certainly has insights on critical issues such as interagency budget battles, working with our allies, and congressional oversight. Mr. Austin is fully committed to the constitutional principle of civilian control of our military, something that those who serve in uniform typically understand and revere more than those who don't. In that regard, I thought some of the testimony from our recent hearing on this important topic was a bit simplistic with discussions about so-called military logic versus political logic. So let me play devil's advocate. The very nature of this confirmation hearing is evidence that civilian control of the military is not at risk in America. I believe the related but opposite problem should be of more concern today. No military experience in the top ranks of our government. With the exception of Mr. Austin, no nominee on the incoming Biden national security team has ever served in uniform. With regard to the entire Biden cabinet, only one other nominee has any military experience at all. This is not wise. If confirmed, I'm sure I won't agree with all of Mr. Austin's decisions, but when the inevitable budget battles occur, 
it will be critical for our nation's security and military members to have a Secretary of Defense who understands firsthand the very real morale and readiness problems that result from drastic cuts to our military. Let me conclude with this. We are living through difficult times, a pandemic, racial tensions, riots, turmoil at the top of the Pentagon and rising dangers from China, Russia, and Iran. Mr. Austin's confirmation won't solve all these problems, but it will help. He represents the best of America, a man of integrity, humility, and character with a wealth of relevant experience. Our allies will take comfort in his confirmation and our adversaries will take pause. And as America's first black Secretary of Defense, he will be an inspiration to millions, both in and out of uniform. I urge my college, colleagues to support his confirmation and the waiver it requires. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan, and I, I do agree with your comments uh, wholeheartedly, and I believe that uh, we're going to be doing the right thing here. Now we have a, uh, another introduction by Secretary Panetta, a former Secretary of, uh, of Defense and a former very close friend of mine who served together in the House together, and, and uh, it's, not, it's been too long. Uh, 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 Secretary Panetta, and you are recognized for your part of this introduction. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Inhofe. Uh, I, I always enjoyed uh, our friendship going back to the House of Representatives. Uh, ranking Member Reed uh, and distinguished members of this committee, uh, it's an honor for me to again have the opportunity to appear before this distinguished committee, this time alongside Senator Dan Sullivan, to introduce President-elect Biden's nominee to be the 28th Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. We do meet at a time of great peril for our nation, but it's also a time of great promise. We have endured a harrowing year dealing with the deadly pandemic, and most recently, the violent attack on our capital, this Congress, and our democracy itself. Our adversaries are watching very closely. They're trying to determine whether America will remain the strongest and most resilient democracy the world has ever known. It's also a time of great promise. Tomorrow at this time, our country will have a new president, a man who many of you know personally from his decades of service as a United States Senator, a man who I've known for over 40 years and had the privilege to work with during my years in the Congress, in the White House, and I was honored to serve him when he was vice president as CIA director and secretary of defense. Joe Biden is absolutely committed to ensuring that we remain the strongest military power on the face of the earth. He believes that we must have the best trained, best equipped, and most capable fighting force in the world. And he believes that the Department of Defense must be led by someone who not only knows the issues of war and peace, but also knows the heart and soul, the women and men who bravely wear the uniform, put their lives on the line, and fight for our freedom. That's why he selected Lloyd Austin to serve as Secretary of Defense. Lloyd's accomplishments at the Department of Defense are without peer. He graduated from West Point. He's leading, he, he led troops at almost every level, commanded in combat, served as America's military commander during the drawdown in Iraq, 
He served as Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and as Commanding General of the U.S. Central Command. And all of you know that that's one of the key combat commands at the Department of Defense. I met Lloyd when I came to DOD as Secretary in July of 2011. We had just six months to implement the drawdown in Iraq. And Lloyd was the man on the ground charged with getting it done. It was a huge logistical task. He consulted carefully with the president, with the vice president, the national security advisor, his colleagues at the State Department, and those in the intelligence community. And he carried out with diligence and professionalism the plan that was set forth by me and other civilian leaders at the Pentagon. He had to negotiate with the Iraqis, who were not easy to negotiate with at that time, and ensured that our troops and all of their equipment could redeploy safely while protecting America's core national security interests. I mentioned this episode because I know that many of you are wondering whether a former general officer can uphold the principle of civilian control of the military. I've spoken to Lloyd, and there is no doubt in my mind that he will uphold the principle of civilian control. And frankly, the best military officers that I had the honor to serve with are those who understand the importance of civilian control. And Lloyd was one of those. He will respect the civilian chain of command enshrined not only in tradition, but in law. He will ensure there is transparency and accountability at the Pentagon. He'll make himself and department leaders available to this committee and to the Congress for oversight. And he'll provide regular briefings to the American people. He will support the appointment of civilian leaders across the office of the secretary and the department. He knows that while we cannot defend our nation without our armed forces, we cannot defend our democratic form of government without strong civilian stewardship of our national security. Lloyd Austin is a man of uncommon character and decency and courage. He's a trailblazer, feared by our enemies and admired by those that he led. He was the first African-American general officer to lead the Army Corps in combat. He was the first African-American to command an entire theater of war. And if confirmed, he will be the first African-American to lead the Department of Defense. In sum, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I believe that Lloyd Austin is the right person at the right time, man that we need at this moment to lead the Department of Defense. He's clear-eyed about the threats, and we know there are a number of threats we're dealing with abroad, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, cyber attackers, and terrorists. He understands the value of alliances, keeping them strong, and supporting them. And he's prepared to shoulder the awesome burden of sending our best men and women in uniform, if necessary, into harm's way. The most difficult task we, who've been Secretary of Defense, had to assume. As Americans watched the tragic images from the Capitol Rotunda on January 6th, on January 6th, 
I was reminded of one painting in that space that has always represented for me the ideal of service to country. That's the oil painting of George Washington resigning his commission as general in the army so that he could assume the duties of being the nation's first president. It's a statement about our democratic form of government that has stood the test of time in that hollowed citadel of liberty. The tradition of military leaders from Washington, Eisenhower, Marshall, to the large number of veterans who are serving in Congress today, including my own son, of taking off our uniforms, returning to civilian life, to lead and to serve again. That tradition is as old as our Republic itself and essential to the quality of leadership we need in order to protect our Constitution and our national security. I am absolutely confident that Lloyd Austin will follow in that tradition. I'm honored to introduce him to the committee and urge his swift confirmation. Thank you, Secretary Panetta. It's uh, great to be with you again after all these years, and you haven't lost a thing. Uh, okay, um, Mr. Austin, we have our first seven questions, and you know what they are, so you're ready to answer them, but answer them audibly if you would. Uh, have you adhered to applicable laws and regulations governing conflict, conflict of interest? I have. Will you ensure that your staff complies with deadlines established for requested communications, including questions for the record in hearings? I will. Will you cooperate in providing witnesses and briefers in response to congressional requests? I will. Will those witnesses be protected from reprisal for their testimony or briefings? They will. Do you agree, if confirmed, to appear and testify upon request before this committee? I do. And do you agree to provide documents, including copies of electronic forms of communication in a timely manner when requested by a duly constituted, constituted committee, or to consult with the committee regarding the basis for any good faith delay or denial in providing such documents? I do. And have you assumed any duties or undertaking any actions uh, which would appear to presume the outcome of the confirmation process? I have not. Uh, thank you very much. As uh, Secretary Panetta clearly stated, we don't have a, there's not a time in, in the past that we've had more threats than we're facing today. And um, throughout my tenure as chairman, this committee is focused on the ensuring that the, the DOD's authorities and resources it needs to implement this, the National Defense Strategy. This document is a document that means a lot to all of us here. It's been our blueprint we've used since uh, 2018. It's put together by six uh, knowledgeable Democrats, six knowledgeable Republicans, and it's served as our blueprint. And I would assume that you would consider continue to do that. As the Secretary of Defense, second in chain of command, you'd be responsible and accountable to the President of the United States and to the American people for implementing this strategy. I look forward to learning how you would drive military readiness for the strategic competition with China and Russia, which we've talked about at length here, how you will also handle some of the provocations from rogue nations like Iran and North Korea. Even worse is that our military's technology advantage has eroded. We're used to the old days when we had the best of everything, and that's, that's not true anymore. We saw, we, we fell down a little bit. I know that between the years of 2010 and 2015, we were dropping our, military, our, our defense in terms of dollars uh, down by about 25%, while China was increasing theirs, uh, uh, Mr. Austin, by 83%. And that's not acceptable. 
the nation and the Department of Defense is going to, to tackle this problem head on if we hope to preserve and defend our way of life from those who would do harm to us. Now, if confirmed, you would have the honor of leading a team of Americans who represent everything that is noble and best for our nation, our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, uh, Marines, space guardians, our military families. And by the way, on the military families, we always hear from those who are a little less enthusiastic about a strong national defense that we spend more than Russia and China put together. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is we care about the families. We care about housing. We care about the largest single expense that we have in military is for our families, our military families. Now, in a communist country, you don't have that. They just give you a gun and said, go out and shoot people. So that's, it's, that's what we are concerned about, and we will continue to do that. Our many defense civil servants also sacrifice day in and day out for our national security and rarely get the credit for they deserve. Uh, the department will require strong civilian leadership. For you to serve as the Secretary of Defense, Congress must provide an exception to the law that prohibits individuals from being appointed if they are within seven years of their military service. Last week, this committee held a hearing on civilian control of the armed services, which uh, I think it was instructive. I've never been all that concerned about the seven years, but uh, others, others have. Um, I hope that you will share with the committee what actions you will take to ensure your tenure reflect, reflects in, uh, and protects the principle of civilian control of the military if you are confirmed. Uh, we look forward to hearing your views on these and other important issues. Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I join you in welcoming uh, Lloyd Austin to today's hearing. General, I want to thank you for your four decades of military service to our country, and I appreciate your willingness to return to public service, this time in a civilian capacity. In addition, I want to welcome your wife, Charlene. I also want to recognize and thank former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta, who spoke on your behalf, and in addition, Senator Sullivan, for their introductions. Today's hearing is also very different from previous Secretary of Defense nomination hearings. Due to recent security threats, the Acting Secretary of Defense has authorized the deployment of 25,000 National Guard troops to Washington, D.C. I never thought I would see such a large display of U.S. military force on the streets of our country. I thank the service members and the other federal agencies for ensuring that the U.S. Capitol and the inauguration is safe and secure. In addition, the world continues to be engulfed in a global pandemic that has caused hundreds of thousands of deaths in the United States and sickened millions more. This has not only affected the way we conduct our hearings, but it's become the paramount issue facing the new administration, including the Department of Defense. General Austin, you have a long and distinguished career. You have served at the highest echelons of the Army and captured your service as the commander of U.S. Central Command. If confirmed as the next Secretary of Defense, you will face a daunting array of current and emerging security threats. U.S. strategic priorities have shifted in recent years, as reflected in the 2018 National Defense Strategy, to focus increasingly on the near-peer competition with China and Russia. At the same time, the Trump administration, through its disruptive behavior, has eroded faith in U.S. global leadership with adverse strategic consequences. Indeed, our national defense strategy must be a component of an overall national security strategy that embraces all aspects of soft power as well as military power. As a former commander of U.S. Central Command, you have valuable experience to addressing security threats in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere in the CENTCOM area of operations. The incoming Biden administration faces an immediate challenge with respect to Iran's growing, <coughs> growing nuclear, ballistic missile, and proxy capabilities. The Department of Defense will pay a key role in deterring these threats while supporting diplomatic efforts. In Iraq and Syria, while the physical ISIS caliphate has been defeated, the underlying factors that gave rise to ISIS and al-Qaeda remain largely unaddressed. Defending against transnational violence, extremist groups will require continued vigilance. In Afghanistan, our allies and partners need to be reassured that going forward, they will be consulted up front on any changes in U.S. force posture. The incoming administration will need to assess the conditions on the ground, including whether the Taliban is, in fact, living up to their commitments and what level of support is required to protect U.S. national security interests and invigorate a diplomatic solution. 
In addition to these broad strategic challenges, as Secretary of Defense, you must also grapple with issues specific to the management of the Department. The fiscal year 2022 budget will be the first that is unconstrained by the Budget Control Act, and some view this as an opportunity to redirect the overall defense budget. This year will mark an inflection point in how the Department prioritizes resources it needs to accomplish its missions. The Department most focus its efforts on critical technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology, and cybersecurity, while also emphasizing rapid delivery of advanced new weapon systems on timelines that keep pace with technological change. The Department of Defense must partner with Congress to find ways to retire legacy systems without incurring too much risk operationally or economically. The Department also has management challenges that require investment in great people to manage the complexities of the Pentagon and its processes rather than an endless search for budget cuts and workforce reductions. Ensuring robust funding for full spectrum readiness, including additional home station training, flying hours, steaming days, depot maintenance and installation sustainment has been a high priority for this committee and I expect it will be yours too. The Department must also hold private housing companies and their defense chain of command accountable to ensure families live in the homes they deserve. Our men and women in uniform and the civilian workforce that supports them remain this committee's top concern, and they must be yours as well. Recruiting and retaining a sufficiently sized, trained, and equipped military of the necessary quality of character and talent to meet national defense requirements is always a paramount goal of the Secretary of Defense and this committee. Successful recruiting and ensuring the health of the force has been and will continue to be a challenge while we finish the national fight against COVID. General Austin, as I have recounted in great detail, if confirmed, you will manage the department coping with many extraordinarily difficult issues. It will require strong civilian leadership to address these challenges and to reverse the erosion of civil military relations over the past several years. However, in order to serve as the Secretary of Defense, Congress must provide an exception to the statutory requirement that prohibits individuals from being appointed if they are within seven years of their military service. Last week, this committee heard from expert witnesses on the state of civilian control of the armed forces. Some members expressed concern that providing an exception for you to serve as the Secretary of Defense, particularly so soon after Secretary Mattis, could harm civil military relations. It is a valid concern, but as our witnesses testified, it is possible to mitigate the effects if you demonstrate your commitment to empowering civilians in the department. Further, we must also hear how you view the role of Secretary of Defense and how that position is different from your days of honorable service as a military officer. This distinction is critical as the Secretary of Defense is an inherently political position requiring a skill set for managing a vast bureaucracy while balancing personalities within the department and across our federal agencies. Relatedly, an effective secretary must be transparent with Congress. Tensions often, often exist between the executive and legislative branches, regardless of political party. However, the department must keep Congress fully informed on critical national security developments so that we can conduct congressional oversight. General Lawson, with these broad categories in mind, I hope you will candidly share what actions you will take to ensure your tenure reflects and protects the principle of civilian control of the military. Finally, strengthening civil military relations is not the sole responsibility of the Secretary of Defense. Congress has a role too. This includes expeditiously confirming qualified civilian nominees to serve in the Pentagon. Furthermore, I believe Congress should revisit the headquarters reductions implemented over the past several years. While well intentioned, these budget cuts have sapped the Department of Experience expertise, and institutional knowledge, all of which degrades the department's ability to oversee the critical policy issues that are integral for robust civilian oversight. Again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to hearing from our nominee. Well, thank you, Senator Reid. Excellent, um, excellent statement. Uh, with some senators attending remotely, I want to let everyone know how we're going to run this thing. Uh, since it's impossible to know exactly when our colleagues who will be joining via computer uh, 
we will not follow our standard early bird timing rule. Instead, we'll handle the order of questions by seniority alternating between sides, Democrat and Republican. Um, until we have gone through everyone, then we'll uh, see how much time we have left and what the wish is. We will do the standard, instead of doing the standard five minutes, Senator Reed and I have, have agreed that a seven minute rounds might be more appropriate. And I ask my colleagues on the computers to please keep an eye on the clock, which you should see on your screens. And we'll try to adhere to those uh, seven minute rounds. Finally, to allow for everyone to be heard, whether in the room or uh, on, on a computer, I ask all colleagues to please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Mr. Austin, we'll begin with your opening statement and uh, be assured that the entirety of your written statement will be made a part of the record. General Austin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Reed, and members of this committee. I'm grateful for your time this afternoon, especially during these momentous days. It was apparent to me and to all Americans two weeks ago how seriously you take your duties to the Constitution. And I thank you for that commitment. I know that you share my gratitude for the commitment of the men and women of the Department of, of Defense as well who share your devotion to that founding document, our Constitution. Many of them are serving overseas. Some of them are serving just outside this room. And all of them are keeping us safe. We owe much to their selflessness and to that of their families. I want to thank Senator Sullivan and Secretary Panetta for their kind words of introduction. I am, I am truly grateful, and of course, I want to thank my wonderful wife, Charlene, who, like today, has stood by my side for more than 40 years, guiding me, supporting me, and making me a better man. I'm also very grateful to President-elect Biden for asking me to serve my country again. I value the strength of my relationship with him, and I am humbled by the trust and confidence that he has placed in me. And I hope this hearing will earn me your trust. Let me say at the outset that I understand and respect the reservations that some of you have expressed about having another recently retired general at the head of the Department of Defense. The safety and security of our democracy demands competent civilian control of our armed forces, the subordination of military power to the civil. I spent my entire life committed to that principle. In war and in peace, I implemented the policies of civilians elected and appointed over me, leaders like Secretary Panetta. And I know that being a member of the President's Cabinet, a political appointee, requires a different perspective and unique duties from a career in uniform. I intend to, to surround myself with an empower experienced, capable civilian leaders who will enable healthy civil-military relations grounded in meaningful oversight. Indeed, I plan to include the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in top decision-making meetings, ensuring strategic and operational decisions are informed by policy. I will rebalance collaboration and coordination between the Joint Staff and the OSD staff to ensure civilian input is integrated at every level of the process. And I will make clear my expectation that the Pentagon work hand in glove with the State Department supporting the work of our diplomats. Now I know that a large measure of civilian control of our military lies right here with this body. And if you confirm me, I assure you that the Pentagon, under my leadership, will respect your oversight responsibilities, and we will be transparent with you. And I will provide you my best counsel, and I will seek yours. And just like you, I will take seriously the many, challenging, many challenges facing our country, the most immediate of which, in my view, is the pandemic. And if confirmed, I will quickly review the Department's contributions to coronavirus relief efforts ensuring that we're doing everything that we can to help distribute vaccines across the country and to vaccinate our troops and preserve readiness. We'll also do everything we can for our military families. They too are educating kids at home and losing their jobs 
and trying to stock the pantry. I know this committee shares my view that we owe them our best efforts to lighten that load. We also owe our people a working environment free of discrimination, hate, and harassment. And if confirmed, I will fight hard to stamp out sexual assault and to rid our ranks of racist and extremist and to create a climate where everyone fit and willing has the opportunity to serve this country with dignity. The job of the Department of Defense is to keep America safe from our enemies. But we can't do that if some of those enemies lie within our own ranks. And for those enemies and adversaries outside the ranks and around the world, we need resources to match strategy, and strategy matched to policy, and policy matched to the will of the American people. And globally, I understand that Asia must be the focus of our effort. And I see China in particular as a pacing challenge for the department. And I know I'll need your help in, in tackling these problems and to give our men and women in uniform the tools that they need to fight and win. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, while I did not seek this job, I consider it an honor. And if confirmed, I will carry out the mission of the Department of Defense, always with the goal to deter war and ensure our nation's security. And I will up uphold the principle of civilian control of the military as intended. And I would not be here asking for your support if I felt that I was unable or, or, unable or unwilling to question people with whom I once served in operations that I once led, or too afraid to speak my mind to you or to the president. I was a general and a soldier, and I'm proud of that. But today I appear before you as a citizen, the son of a postal worker, and a homemaker from Thomasville, Georgia. And I'm proud of that too. And if you confirm me, I am prepared to serve now as a civilian, fully acknowledging the importance of this distinction. And I thank you again for consideration of my nomination and for your steadfast support of our men and women in uniform, our civilians and their families. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Austin. Great statement. You heard my comments, General Austin, about the, the document, the National Defense Strategy. You're familiar with this. I'm sure you've read it many times. Uh, what do you think about its relevance today? Uh, have you seen changes that should be made on this, or what, what's your feeling today contemporarily about this statement? I think much of the document is absolutely on track for today's challenges, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as is the case with, uh, with all strategies, uh, if confirmed, one of the things that I would look to do is, is to work to update the strategy mm -hmm. and work within the confines of the guidance and the policy uh, issued by uh, the, current, uh, the next administration. Yeah, well, that's right. And the guidance also from this, this document, uh, I, th I think, is still relevant today. In this document, the uh, previous two secretaries of defense, Secretary Mattis, Secretary Esper, both agreed that that document uh, it, it prescribed that we'd probably need a three to five percent re real growth in defense budget effectively in the coming years. Uh, do you agree generally with that statement? Well, Mr. Chairman, as I, as I said in the opening statement, I believe that our resources need to match our strategy and our, our strategy needs to match our policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would assume that would be yes. And others were going to be asking about the civilian and military relations. I know that, but let me cover a couple of things that I, I think are, are important. The, um, on the nuclear triad, a lot of people who are, have different ideas on what we should do and the priorities we have in, uh, in uh, our, our defense system, uh, that we, they try to whittle away at the nuclear triad. And uh, uh, we have always felt, and the secretaries of defense, uh, that nuclear deterrence is, do you agree with them that nuclear, their assessment that nuclear deterrence is the DOD's highest priority mission? I, I do, Mr. Chairman. 
And do you agree that the triad, the, 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 the land, air, and sea-based nuclear delivery platforms uh, are still necessary, even though we do hear a lot of arguments that w two of the three would be adequate? What do you think? Mr. Tr Mr. Chairman, I believe that the triad has served us well uh, in the past, and I certainly believe that it will continue to do so going forward. And I personally support the triad. Good. I, uh, we've had kind of a forgotten continent for a long period of time in Africa. I can remember when Africa was in three different commands. It was in the, uh, uh, the PACOM, the uh, Central Command, and, uh, and the uh, uh, UCOM. And we came along with uh, AFRICOM, and I think it's things have really improved since that time. And I'm really, uh, I think it's a critical uh, theater for implementing this uh, national defense strategy that we have. Uh, we see China uh, all over. People talk about the South China Sea, about their building of the islands and all these things that are going on. But they forget that China has, for the first time, left their city limits to uh, support a major objective on their behalf, and that's in Djibouti. And they go not just in Djibouti, but all throughout China, uh, as far south as the southern part of Tanzania. And, it's, uh, and so it, it's very active in that, uh, in that area. I would ask you, right now we have six, some 6,000 DOD personnel on the continent. I know there's been an effort, there's an effort in this last administration to be reducing in some areas what our presence, what our resources, how they should be uh, put out. My feeling was that uh, we had inadequate resources to start with only 6,000 in the entire continent. Do you have any thoughts that you've given to, uh, uh, to that in terms of the resources that we need to use in that part of the world? Mr. Chairman, uh, Africa, like some other places in the world has been, has been uh, one of those places where we've been able to uh, gain good effect uh, by, with a small amount of uh, investment by helping, to, uh, helping our partners to increase their, their ability to uh, defend their sovereign territory and to protect themselves. Uh, that's, that's excellent. We have to keep in mind that they have, many of our closest allies are there right now, and if we should deteriorate our presence, in any way, we would, uh, I, I have a feeling they'd do the same thing. So I appreciate that uh, very much. One last thing I want to touch on, because it is a current issue. Ever since the International Court of Justice ruled way back in, uh, in 1975, I believe it was, that, uh, that we have in Western Sahara, we supported a referendum for self-determination. Now, the United States has done that ever since the 1970s. The UN has done that since the 1970s. The African Union has done that, and most all of the 52 nations of Africa have all stated that the Western Sahara should have a referendum for self-determination. What do you think? Well, that's uh, an issue that I certainly would uh, want to take a closer look at, uh, Mr. Chairman, before I gave you a uh, a, uh, a detailed answer, but I, it's one of the things that I'll, I'll look at uh, if confirmed right away going into the, into the position. Yeah, and I'd like to have you keep in mind that they have been consistent for so many years now, and, uh, and so I would, I would anticipate that yours, your feelings would be the same. Uh, Senator Reed. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Lawson. Uh, one issue uh, that is obvious is the, the discussion of so the erosion of civilian uh, control, participation, influence on the Department of Defense. That was highlighted by the National uh, Defense Security uh, document, which the chairman has displayed. Uh, but the suggestion there was it was not something that was happening in an instant, that it was taking place over years. And part of that, I believe, is uh, the, the lack of competent civilian authorities in place. Um, there are many individuals, as I suggested in my statement, that are acting. There are others who are uh, civil servants who have been pushed up into uh, jobs that normally require confirmation. And there's been a, a lack of uh, sometimes candidates for confirmation. So. 
I would ask you, uh, if you are confirmed, will you do your utmost to ensure that every position, civilian position in the department is filled, that we get nominees promptly? I know you have to work through the White House, and that uh, other individuals will be uh, put in positions where they are both skilled and qualified. Absolutely, uh, Senator Reid. I, I will do everything I can to move as quickly as I can to to move to fill those positions with experienced and competent, uh, qualified uh, civilians. And I, I will need the help of, uh, of this body yeah. to make sure that, uh, that we're moving quickly. Yeah, I concur. We, we, this has to be a collaborative effort. I think in addition to that, it, uh, with the civilian employee uh, members, uh, and as you suggest in your remarks, you have to ensure that there's a, a very appropriate uh, working relationship with uniformed personnel, particularly in the Joint Staff. And I, from your comments, I assume you'll, that'll be one of your priorities, to make sure that, and indeed, that the civilians have a, a, a critical role in that uh, process. Is that correct? It's absolutely correct, uh, Senator Reid. Uh, I think it's imperative that the, uh, the OSD staff maintain primacy in terms of uh, crafting strategy and policy, and I think uh, you know we need we'll need the right uh, uh, civilians in the in key positions to help help us do that. And we've already begun to move down that road. You've seen uh, Colin Call nominated to be uh, the Undersecretary for Policy, uh, very talented young man that that will do well. You've seen Kath Hicks nominated to be the Dep Deputy Secretary of Defense. So. W w we're off to a good start, and we'll continue to maintain momentum in filling those positions and making sure that we rebalance uh, the, the, the workload between the joint staff and, and the secretariat. Thank you. Uh, on another subject, uh, uh, the need for strength in alliances uh, seems to be obvious, but uh, something that you're going to have to take on immediately. Uh, I'm thinking of the Pacific Defense Initiative, which the chairman was the principal author, and it's based on solidifying our relationships, both the diplomatic and operation, operationally, with our near partners in the Pacific, the, the Australians, the Japanese, and the South Korea, and then building further uh, with other uh, Pacific nations. Uh, and I would presume and hope that you would see that as an important uh, task also, building up our relationships and alliances, which in many respects have been neglected. Is, is that something that you see as important? I, I think it's critical, uh, Senator Reid, and I also uh, look very much look forward to uh, uh, going out and refurbishing uh, those alliances and making sure that, that we, we build additional capacity where possible. And you can look to when we are, when we do uh, begin to travel again, that you know, that region will be my, one of my first stops. Right. You, you know, there's the old saying, there's strength in numbers. And uh, I think there's some truth to that. So as we build up our, not just in a, a superficial way, but training together, conducting exercises together, integrating our intelligence, integrating our uh, operations uh, you know, at sea, on land, and in the air, uh, that, I think, it could be the best deterrent we could think of with respect to the aspirations of China, uh, I, and I think you might concur. I agree. Uh, one of the tasks you're going to have is as you're trying to deal with all these crises around the world, you also have to transform the Department of Defense. As the chairman indicated, uh, our technological advantage, uh, which was, we thought, uncontested in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, et cetera, is contested. In fact, there are suggestions that we know might not be ahead in many places. And so you're going to have to think very seriously about how do we elevate science, how do we, more importantly, take our scientific developments, our prototypes, and get it to the field, to soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines in the field. And if any comments on that, I'd appreciate it. I, I certainly agree with you, Senator Reid, that, that uh our acquisition system needs to be more agile and more responsive to the needs that you, you just mentioned. We, we need to get the capability uh, down to the, to the uh, 
to the people who need it, the people who are going to use it as quickly as possible. And I also say that we need to develop the operational uh, concepts that support those new capabilities to make sure that uh, we, we continue to present a, a, a credible deterrent. But uh, I absolutely agree that there's much to be done in terms of uh, working with the, uh, with the acquisition uh, process to make sure that it becomes more agile. Well, thank you. And I, just as a final point, I think I have to respond to the challenge that the chairman gave you to reach your 61st wedding anniversary. <laughs> Having been married at the, for the first time at the age of 55, despite my best efforts, I can guarantee the chairman I will not reach 61 <laughs> years. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe that. <laughs> Senator Wicker. Senator Reid, you just do it one day at a time. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Good advice, Senator Wicker. Mr. Alston, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for the conversation that we had several weeks ago over the phone. And thank you for your willingness to serve in the military and now to serve in a civilian capacity. You're a West Point graduate. Um, I pointed out to Senator Reid that I'm wearing an Army tie today in, in your honor, but I suppose also in honor of, uh, of Senator Reid and all the distinguished Army folks, uh, I'm, an, I'm an Air Force veteran myself, uh, but I'm also a former chair of the Sea Power Subcommittee. And so today, I, I want to talk to you uh, at the beginning about Sea Power. Um, the 30-year uh, shipbuilding plan was finally released just last month by uh, the leadership in the Navy. And um, it calls um, for 405 manned ships by the year 2051. That's compared to a 355 uh, ship requirement that we previously had and that we uh, actually placed into the statute. Have you read the 30-year shipbuilding plan, Mr. Austin? I, I've not read the ship, the 30-year plan yet, Mr. Uh, Senator Wicker. Are, are you familiar with the fact that the 30-year shipbuilding plan uh, calls for in, increasing our requirement? Um, it actually, it, it um, increases our requirement from 355 ships to 405 manned ships by the year 2051. I, I am familiar with that, uh, with that fact. Do you support that uh, finding? Well, I... I certainly, I would just say, Senator, I, our Navy is uh, the most capable uh, naval force on the face of the planet. It will remain so if, if, uh, if I'm confirmed and, and become Secretary of Defense. Uh, I think that it's important that we maintain the capabilities that uh, we'll need to be relevant not only today but relevant tomorrow. So I look forward to getting on the ground and if confirmed and working with uh, with the leadership of the Navy to better understand, uh, you know, the requirements and, and how we're uh, uh, going to support those requirements. And, and also, I look forward to working with this body to make sure that we have the right resources uh, to, to, to support that requirement. Well, that does uh, bring me to um, a, a, a point that I need to make, and that is that uh, within the administration, it's not only the White House, and it's not only um, uh, DOD, but also OMB it is a mighty big gorilla sitting in the room there, and they, they force a lot of constraints upon us. Let, let me just say to you that I, I hope you will uh, soon become familiar with this shipbuilding plan um, and, uh, and be able to, to give us... Um, uh, a more definite answer ab about the need for um, for an increased Navy to, to do the things that we have to do. Uh, it calls for adding 82 new ships between 2022 and 2026 at a cost of $147 billion. Um, previously, um, that number was only 44 ships. So the new the new requirement, the new plan is 82 new ships in that short four-year period rather than 44 ships and uh, an extra uh, $45 billion over that time frame. So 
Uh, rest assured that we need to have more conversations there. Uh, it, the distinguished chairman mentioned China, the fact that their uh, ambitions not only are in the Pacific, but also extend to Africa, and he named a few locations there. Um, the um, DOD report to Congress on China recently said it is likely China will aim to develop a military by mid-century that is equal to, or in some cases superior to, the U.S. military. Do you agree with that assessment, Mr. Austin? I, I would agree. I would agree that that's their goal. Uh, my job, if confirmed as Secretary of Defense, is to make sure that we develop the, uh, the capabilities, the plans, and the operational concepts to ensure that we maintain a competitive edge. And, and so that, while that may be their goal, uh, I, I would, again, if I'm confirmed, would intend to make sure that that never happens. Well, it's my contention that the new shipbuilding plan calling for 405 uh, manned ships by the year 2051 uh, and additional 82 new ships in the next uh, five years is part and parcel to answering that challenge. What do you say to that, Mr. Austin? I certainly say that we need to have the, you know, the right uh, kinds of capability uh, to be able to counter the, you know, the emerging threat. And, uh, and again, I look forward to having that conversation with the, with the uh, Department of the Navy. Uh, I, if, if that's the uh, analysis that's been provided by the Navy, I have every reason to believe that uh, it's accurate. But I, I really would like to have that conversation in more depth. Let me quote another uh, Army man, a distinguished uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, uh, who uh, said just last month, quote, look, I'm an Army guy and I love the Army, but the fundamental defense of the United States and the ability to project power, power forward will always be for America, naval and, and airspace power. I would just commend to you that statement and suggest that, that um, the, the additional uh, sea power is going, is going to be necessary. Uh, I would also um, I want you to comment, and I'll just ask you because we're time constrained, to comment about the idea of basing two additional destroyers at Rota, Spain, to, uh, to be there to combat Russian aggression. But, Mr. Chairman, because I only have two seconds, I'll take that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Wicker. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Austin, thank you for being willing to be considered for this important post at this critical time in our nation's history. Um, as you're probably aware, last week this committee received testimony from outside experts on the issue of the waiver that will be required for you to serve and the whole issue of civil military relations and I know you addressed that briefly in your opening comments and Senator Reid followed up with some specific questions but one of the interesting things to me in that hearing last week was one of the people testifying talked about the concern that during Secretary Mattis' tenure that there was an over deference to military views that were critical to shaping America's military policy or defense policy. Can you talk about how you would respond to those concerns and what you think should be done to ensure that the balance continues with the prominence being on civilian control of the military? Yeah, thank you, Senator. I, I, I believe that you need to have the right people in the right positions that can be in, that are in the decision-making process. And so, you know, I'd look to have a very experienced undersecretary for policy. Uh, I'd look to have a very experienced uh, deputy secretary of defense. Uh, my chief of staff uh, will not, if I'm confirmed, will not be a military person, but yet a person that's, uh, that really understands strategy and policy and, and also has uh, deep ties to the Hill as well as, uh, as to the White House. And so I think the people in the room when, when, and, and contributing to the decision-making, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. 
So to answer your question, I, I will make sure that, that you know, we staff the positions with the right people who, who have the right experiences and who are not afraid to, uh, to provide their input, and I will empower them uh, to make sure that uh, you know, they have the flexibility to, to, to get the job done, to coordinate with the joint staff and, and coordinate with uh, other agencies to ensure that we have a policy, uh, we have a significant policy input on every decision. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, especially the importance of the empowerment of those individuals. When we talked shortly after your nomination was put forward, I, we talked about two of New Hampshire's um, military installations that we are very proud of, the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, which is shared between New Hampshire and Maine, and also our 157th Air Refueling Wing at Pease National Guard, which was the first Air National Guard base to receive the new KC-46 refueling tanker. And there are two long-term concerns that I have about those installations. One is the shipyard optimization plan as we look at the need to invest in our public shipyards in the future. That optimization plan is going to be critical to ensuring that the capacity is there, not just at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, but our other public shipyards to support our naval fleet. And I hope that you will remain committed to that plan and to moving forward with that plan as we look at the, at the upcoming years. I will, Senator. Um, and the other is the KC-46 and the continuing issues with getting that tanker online. Um, as you know, the most recent one is the remote vision system, which still is not fixed in a way that allows those tankers to fly and do the refueling mission that is so critical. Um, again, I would hope that you will stay on that issue with Boeing and make sure we get those planes right so that they can do the refueling that we're paying for them to do. Uh, you, uh, I will absolutely stay on this, uh, on this issue. I think it's critical. It's a critical component of our overall force. And, uh, and so I think it's, uh, it's important that, uh, that we continue to press and, and get this capability to where it needs to be. Great, and I hope you will come up to New Hampshire and visit both of those installations at some point in your tenure, if confirmed. Um, I would like to ask you about Afghanistan next, because as we look at where we are in Afghanistan, the treaty or the agreement, I don't know what we want to call it, because clearly the Taliban is not complying with what have been announced as concessions that were made as part of that agreement. Um, also, the failure of that agreement to take into consideration the role of women and minorities in Afghanistan that have been so important as they have written a new constitution. And as we look at ending conflict there, one of the things we know from the data is that when women are at the table in negotiations that there is a 35 percent better chance that those peace agreements will last 15 years or longer. So this isn't just for the optics. It looks great to have women at the table. It's about how do we ensure that those negotiations are long lasting. And I wonder if you can talk about what you would like to see at this point in um, Afghanistan as we think about how do we withdraw there in a way that leaves a country that enshrines some of the changes that have been made to support a new constitution and all of the effort that's been put in there by the United States and so many other countries in the world. Well, Senator, I, I certainly would like to see uh, this conflict end with a, with a negotiated settlement. Uh, and I think we're going to make every effort uh, uh, that we can to, to ensure that that happens. I would also like to say, you know, up front, uh, I am truly grateful for the sacrifices of the thousands of men and women that have gone through Afghanistan and, and given so much, sacrificed so much. Uh, to, to your point, uh, their work has made a difference. Um, but I think uh, this conflict needs to uh, come to a, a, you know, an end, and you know, we need to see a, uh, an agreement reached uh, and uh, and in accordance with what the president-elect wants to see, 
I think we want to see an Afghanistan in the future that does not present a threat to America. So Absolutely. a focus on, uh, on some counterterrorism issues, I think, in the future, I think, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. And uh, via WebEx, Senator Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, General Austin. Uh, this committee has consistently heard testimony, including from every STRATCOM commander who has appeared before this committee since I've been a member, recommending against making unilateral reductions to our nuclear forces. Do you agree that making unilateral reductions is unwise? Senator, I'm having a tough time. Yeah, you. the volume seems not to be high enough. If anyone knows how to adjust that, this is a good time to do it. Let me see if I do. That, that sounds better. Do you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I was asking, sir, about uh, making unilateral reductions to our nuclear forces. Uh, do you agree that making these reductions unilaterally is unwise? I, I, I think that uh, we should, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, getting on board of CONFIRM and, and having uh, an ability to kind of look under the hood and, and see exactly what we're doing with our nuclear uh, forces. Uh, so uh, once I've had a chance to do that, Senator, I would love to come back and, and, and discuss it with you. In your um, answer to some questions that were sent over to you, uh, you said that um, you said, I believe it is in the national security interests of the United States and its allies and partners to pursue formal, verifiable arms control agreements that reduce the nuclear threats from Russia and China. Is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> so reductions should be made through negotiated, verifiable agreements, not unilaterally. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, another fact that has been consistently emphasized by civilian officials and military leaders in both the Obama and Trump administrations is that nuclear modernization cannot be delayed any further. Speaking in 2016, President Obama's Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, put it in the following way. The fact is, most of our nuclear weapon delivery systems have already been extended decades beyond their original expected service lives. So it's not a choice between replacing these platforms or keeping them. It's really a choice between replacing them or losing them. That would mean losing confidence in our ability to deter, which we can't afford in today's volatile security environment. More recently, Admiral Richard, the current STRATCOM commander, in his posture statement last year, testified that, quote, many of the modernization and sustainment efforts necessary to ensure the deterrence viability have zero schedule margin and are late to need, end quote. He went on to state, we cannot afford more delays and uncertainty in delivering capabilities and must maintain a focus on revitalizing our nuclear forces and the associated infrastructure. Uh, General, is this also your understanding of the modernization schedule? Well, I, uh, again, and I misunderstood your first part, uh, first part of the question there when you were, when you started out. Uh, what I wanted to tell you was I really look forward to getting into the details of the nuclear modernization program, uh, you know, if, if confirmed. And, you know, I, I really would like to, say, to, to be able to look at the details of exactly what we're choosing to invest in uh, and, and the timelines associated with that. And I, I would love to come back to you and, and discuss that with you. I would have your insurance, assurance, though, that you would, of course, uh, be visiting with the current STRATCOM combatant commander as well as previous ones about the the need to make sure that we have these uh, platforms that we need. That will and be a, also... That will be a top ahead. priority, Senator. I, I guess I'm kind of surprised by your answer, uh, General. When, when the chairman asked you about the triad specifically, 
about maintaining an effective nuclear triad of land, air, and sea-based platforms, um, I thought your answer was, yes, we have to maintain that effective nuclear triad. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. And I realize that, that you do have to review um, where, where we currently are in modernization, but I would think under having an understanding that every administration and every STRATCOM commander and also our, our um, secretaries of defense have been adamant that we cannot fall behind on this. Um, your answer that you would have to get back on me is somewhat surprising. I, I understand it's a, it's a complicated topic, um, but it is a 60 year old foundational concept that, that we have here. Yes, Senator, and, and I, think, I think that we're in agreement that this is a priority, this needs to remain a priority. Uh, what I was just conveying was the specific timelines of which pieces are, 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 uh, are being uh, uh, resourced at what rate. Uh, those things I, I would really like to get into details and have a further discussion with you on. But there's no question that I consider this to be a priority and it will remain a priority and I look forward to uh, getting with uh, the STRATCOM commander and having that discussion in detail. Well, thank you. I hope also, if you are confirmed, you will be a strong advocate for the National Nuclear Security Administration uh, being able to receive sufficient funding so that they can meet the Department of Defense's needs. I will be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Fisher. Now via WebEx, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Austin, uh, President-elect Biden made overturning President Trump's ban on open transgender military service a day one priority. Can you confirm your commitment and tell the committee how you plan to reinstate open service? I support the president's plan or uh, plan to, uh, to overturn the, uh, the ban. Uh, I truly believe, uh, Senator, that as I said in my opening statement, that if you're a fit and you're qualified uh, to serve and you can maintain the standards, you should be allowed to serve. And you can expect that, uh, that I will support that throughout. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Uh, when we met together, we talked at length about the scourge of military sexual assault uh, in the military. Uh, we talked about um, how this has been an issue for decades. And in fact, we talked about all the efforts that the Department of Defense has made over at least the last decade that I've been on the Armed Services Committee to try to eradicate it. Every Secretary of Defense um, from the last 25 years has said there is a zero tolerance for sexual assault in the military. But every time they say there's zero tolerance, we look at the facts, we look at the evidence, we look at how many sexual assaults are committed, how many go to trial, how many end of conviction, and we don't seem to improve at all. In fact, last year, the Department of Defense announced a record number of sexual assaults reported by or against service members and the lowest conviction rate for their assailants on record. In your opinion, does this reflect good order and discipline within the military? Does this reflect enhanced military readiness? Senator, I, I take the, the issue of sexual assault seriously and personally. And to, the, to your point, Senator, I think uh, we put a lot of effort into this and, and, and I'm grateful for all of the effort that you have personally put into this and this committee has put into this but we have not gotten better, and we have to get better, and we will get better. We have to, we have to go after the culture, we have to go after the climate. We, we, this is a leadership issue, it's a readiness issue. And it starts from the top, and we gotta work from the bottom as well, simultaneously. 
So therefore, is your answer yes, that it does not reflect good order and discipline and does not, affect, uh, does not reflect the readiness that you would like your service to have? That's correct, Senator. Furthermore, the most recent Pentagon survey on the topic found that 64% of sexual assault survivors who reported their crime perceived some form of retaliation for reporting that crime, often from the exact chain of command that's supposed to protect them. This number is statistically unchanged from 2016. Does this suggest to you adequate progress on what the top brass has promised to do year after year? Do you believe that this is sufficient progress? I absolutely do not believe that it's, it's progress, Senator. Well, given the total lack of progress or accountability within the military justice system, do you believe that a new approach must be taken? Because as we discussed the recent events at Fort Hood, a new approach is clearly warranted. What is your view on that? I, I certainly believe that, that we, do, we need to do better, a lot of things better in terms of uh, in, investigation and, and prosecutions. And, uh, and I think uh, we, we have to look at this holistically. And I, I, I'm, I know that you know that President-elect has committed to uh, standing up a 90-day commission to really look at this soup to nuts. And I look forward to the, uh, you know, to the, the readout of that commission, but I won't wait for 90 days to get after this. As I indicated, this starts with me, and you can, you can count on me getting after this on day one. Well, to be honest, um, President-elect Biden said much more than that. He promised much more than a commission. He said, in fact, when asked directly by Protect Our Defenders Nancy Parrish if he would support, quote, moving the military justice system into the 21st century by allowing military prosecutors to make prosecu prosecution decisions for non-military crimes, serious felonies like rape, murder, and child abuse, end of quote, and that President-elect Biden in response said, quote, yes, 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 end of quote. So do you share President-elect Biden's commitment to move prosecutorial decisions outside the chain of command and giving that decision to trained military prosecutors? I would like, if confirmed, I would like to work with the chain of command and, and uh, very rapidly uh, assess uh, what things uh, that there are that need to, be, need to be fixed or addressed, and I'd like to make those recommendations and provide those assessments to, uh, to the president-elect. But you do agree that we can't keep doing the same thing that we've been doing for the past decade. I absolutely agree with that, Senator. I absolutely agree with that. Do I have your commitment to be relentless on this issue until we can end the scourge of sexual violence in the military? You have my commitment. Okay. I'd now like to move to civil military relations. Mr. Austin, scholars rightly argue that the Secretary of Defense plays a critical role in maintaining balanced civilian military relations by explaining the military's activities to the public. Secretary Mattis, another recently retired general who required a waiver to serve, did not embrace this role. According to Bob Woodward's book, Fear, Mattis grew so tired of being asked to appear on Sunday shows that he threatened to send Sean Spicer to Afghanistan. Mr. Austin, can you commit to following in the footsteps of your predecessors and regularly appearing on TV to explain to Americans where the administration has asked service members to risk their lives and why? I fully understand and appreciate the role that Secretary of Defense has in communicating with the American public, uh, Senator. And uh, you have my commitment that, uh, that I will establish a good relationship with the media and provide them the, the access and the, uh, and the information required uh, to do their job of reporting out to the American people. Thank you, Mr. Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Senator Cotton. Congratulations, General Austin, on your nomination. And thank you for your appearance today, and especially for your four decades of military service. Unfortunately, I must announce that I oppose the waiver of the seven-year cooling-off period. My decision reflects not at all on you personally or your record, which I respect. Rather, I believe Congress should no longer grant such waivers at all. 
I supported the waiver for General Mattis with reservations four years ago, which I quickly came to view as a mistake and I have since regretted. For that matter, upon further reading of the historical record, I now believe the waiver for General Marshall in 1950 was also a mistake. Under no foreseeable circumstances can I imagine supporting such a waiver again. Again, General Austin, my reasons for this decision are distinct and separate from your nomination. And put simply, my reasons are the same reasons we have a cooling off period for recently retired generals in the first place. Some of those reasons are simply a fact, not something that you can address or about which you can grant reassurance. Uh, others, you can give reassurance, I'll give you that opportunity in a moment. Among those concerns I have that I don't think can be addressed are the following. First, the perception that these waivers are now routine, not extraordinary. Senator Reid said in 2017 that he wouldn't support another waiver and they should only happen, quote, once in a generation. No matter what we say, though, if we approve two waivers in just four years, our actions will speak louder than our words. Second, the perception among flag officers that a four-star billet isn't a career capstone. Some generals and admirals may begin to think if they play their cards right, they too can become a secretary in just a few years. I don't think that's good for the force or for the country. Three, the perception among the American people that military, the military expertise of our general officers is the same as national security expertise more broadly, and that the latter resides chiefly in the military, which I also believe is unhealthy for our democracy. And four, the perception, the perception of potential Army favoritism. As a 41-year officer in the Army, many observers may disbelieve that you can hang up the Army green, rightly or wrongly. If you make the right decision for the Army over the other services, and those services advocates may say, it's because of favoritism. Make the correct decision for another service against the Army, and the Army's advocates will say, you're protecting your flank against such charges of favoritism. Neither one of those may be true in the case, but I believe it's unavoidable. Those concerns alone are weighty and enough for me to oppose this waiver, as I should have done four years ago. But there are still more reasons behind the cooling off period. As I said, though, you can give reassurances about some of these concerns, and I want to give you the opportunity to do that. First, Secretary of Defense is not a partisan job, but it is very much a political job. Bob Gates is a good example. He served in a Republican and Democratic administration with great political skill. We, of course, expect our generals like you and General Mattis to be apolitical, but our troops deserve a secretary with the political skills and willingness to fight for them, whether within the Pentagon against its bureaucracy, within the cabinet in fights over policy and budgetary resources, or against parochial members of Congress. So General Austin, what can you say to address this concern? If, for instance, John Kerry wants to sacrifice our force posture on China's periphery, in return for ephemeral promises from China to reduce emissions in 2070. Or if Jennifer Granholm wants to rob the nuclear security budget to fund pie-in-the-sky green energy programs. Or simply if the Office of Management and Budget wants to cut the military's budget. How would you manage such inherently political disputes? Well, certainly uh, in terms of uh, providing resources for uh, the military, uh, my goal is to, my job is to defend this, this, uh, this country if I'm confirmed as a Secretary of Defense. And so I believe that we need to have the adequate resources to be able to do that. Uh, in order to help me uh, get my, uh, work the issues and, and make my points throughout the, the interagency, number one, I'll develop uh, good, great relationships with my partners in state and OMB and other places. Number two, I'll hire the right people to be on my staff to make sure that they are working with me uh, to, and, and crafting uh, the right language to be able to uh, be successful in this dialogue. Thank you, General. If confirmed, I do urge you uh, to be a forceful political advocate for the Department and its interests, uh, both inside the Cabinet and with the Congress as well. A second concern I'd like you to address is that the Secretary also holds a public office. Bob Gates routinely held on-camera press briefings about major decisions, new policies, public controversies, and so forth. Those have been almost non-existent for the last four years. General Austin, if confirmed, will you commit to hold regular on-camera press briefings? Yes. Will you also commit to appear on television programs to explain the key issues of the day as Senator Gillibrand raised? 
Yes. Thank you. A third and final concern I want you to address is that a recently retired general is apt to bring with him much of his former military staff, perhaps recreating his last command as a kind of supreme combatant command, also likely to rely too much on the Joint Staff. General Austin, could you please discuss, if confirmed, how many of your former military staff from your various senior commands you plan to hire and how you will balance the Joint Staff with civilian appointees, the services, and the combatant commands? The, the key billets for, uh, for my staff, uh, all of those positions are being, uh, we're looking at filling all of those positions, if I'm confirmed, with experienced uh, senior civilians uh, that, that uh, again, I'll empower to, to be able to get their job done. Thank you. Again, General Austin, my concerns about these waivers don't bear at all on your nomination or your record of service to our nation, for which I have the highest regard. I, I thank you again for answering the call of duty to your country. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Austin, Mr. Austin, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your extraordinary career of service, which I deeply respect and admire. My opposition to the waiver is not personal. It's a matter of principle. And I want to move on to the merits of the policy issues that will confront you if confirmed. In my view, you have expressed clearly and cogently your commitment to strengthening civilian control over the military, which you would implement if confirmed. Uh, first, uh, I have been deeply alarmed, as have been many of my colleagues, by the rise of white supremacist and extremist ideology in the military. You and I have discussed it. The latest signs are, in fact, that two National Guard members have been removed from their duties regarding the inaugural because of their potential links to extremist sentiments or organizations. Uh, I, last week, I led 13 of my colleagues in a letter to the Department of Defense Inspector General asking for an immediate intensive investigation of the prevalence of white supremacy and extremist ideology. I'm asking for your commitment that you will cooperate with and support that investigation shortly after our letter the Department of Defense indicated it was going to do an evaluation of this issue, but I want an intensive investigation and action to counter it, and I look forward, hopefully, to working with you in countering and combating this very important threat. I, I certainly look forward to working with you on this, uh, Senator. I, uh, I think this is critical. Uh, I, I would share a story with you that uh, from my past, where when I was a lieutenant colonel working in probably uh, the finest, one of the finest organizations in the Army, the 82nd Airborne Division, what, we woke up one day and discovered that we had extremist uh, elements in our ranks. And, and they did bad things that, uh, that we held, certainly held them accountable for. But we discovered that the signs for the, that activity were there all along. We just didn't know what to look for or what to pay attention to, but we learned from that. And I think this is one of those things that, that's important to our military to make sure that we keep a handle on, make sure our leaders are doing the right things, that they're taking care of their, their troops, they understand, they know their troops, and we can never take our hands off the wheel on this. Thank this you, has General. no place in the military of the United States of America. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that answer. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony the importance of the Chinese threat, the need to focus on it. But the most recent attack on our country was by Russia, which for months literally intruded, interfered, and attacked our nation in cyberspace, in part because, as General Nakasone testified to us, our adversaries do not fear us. That's exactly what he said in the cyber domain. I'd like to ask you to commit to conducting a top-down review of our cyber operations, including DOD's posture and structure, and to making our adversaries pay a price when they attack us, as the Russians did through SolarWinds. 
you, you have my commitment uh, that I will conduct that, that review. I, I think that there's a review ongoing now to, to really ascertain uh, what transpired. You know, I'll, I'll join that if confirmed in stride, and I really look forward to understanding with clarity what, uh, what really happened. And I truly believe that, uh, well, the FBI and the NSA have given Russia credit for this. They have attributed uh, this, this activity to Russia. And if that's the case, I think Russia should be held accountable. That's my personal belief. Thank you. Uh, environmental action and climate change are more important than ever. I know the President-elect is going to focus on it. As you and I have discussed in our meeting, the Department of Defense has an immense role to play. I welcome your comments on PFAS and the increasing resilience of our military installations. I'd like to work with you on a total program or plan for the Department of Defense beyond the magnitude of what is done now. And I know you've indicated your interest in it, so I'm not going to ask questions about it, but I do think that the use and procurement of clean energy, the energy efficiency steps that DOD can take will not only save dollars, it will save energy and environmental values and provide leadership for the whole world. I want to focus on uh, military sexual assault, which uh, my colleague, Senator Gillibrand, did so well before, and say that I'm working on legislation that would create liability for perpetrators and for the Department of Defense for sexual misconduct in among service members so that the survivors would have a right of action. They would be empowered to take action. Will you support that kind of legislation, sir? Well, I certainly look forward to reviewing what's in the legislation, uh, Senator, and, uh, and would love to have that discussion with you once I've had the, uh, the ability to do that. And, and I just want to take a moment to thank both you and Senator, Senator Gillibrand for the tremendous work uh, especially Senator, Senator Gillibrand, for the work that you have both done uh, to counter sexual assault in our ranks. Uh, and if confirmed, I look forward to working with both of you on this issue. I appreciate that point. Uh, let me just say uh, I, I welcomed and appreciate your focus in your written remarks in answers to specific questions on the need to focus on our suppliers, our supply chain, our workforce, our defense industrial base, which are very important to Connecticut, where we are the submarine capital of the world at Electric Boat, and where a trained workforce is especially important, but the supply chain equally so. And I'd like you to review, uh, because I'm out of time, legislation that I've proposed that would give the mayor of the District of Columbia the same powers that governors have over the National Guard, because a lot of the very unfortunate lack of planning and coordination between federal and local agencies that has been on display over recent months, in my view, is attributable to the lack of that power on the part of, in effect, the <clears throat> locally empowered official here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, General, for being here today. We certainly appreciate your commitment and your service um, to our great nation, and thank you for stepping forward with this um, nomination. I just want to briefly um, touch upon the issue of sexual harassment, sexual assault, as Senator Gillibrand and, uh, and Senator Blumenthal just did. We had a conversation about this last week. Thank you very much for that. Um, but part of that Fort Hood report that came forward stated that the military readiness requirement superseded the need to protect our service members. Um, what are your feelings as to that statement, and then how do we move forward and correct that? Senator, I, I earnestly, I, I honestly don't believe that these two issues are mutually exclusive. 
we absolutely have to take care of the men and women that are in our ranks. You know, a failure to do so, I mean, we are about people in the military. We have the greatest, the best equipment in the world, and, 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 and I get that, but this is about people. Uh, you know, we, if we don't take care of our people, it's really, really tough to do the job at hand, and that's to defend this country. And, and so I, I do not see these two issues as being uh, at odds with each other. I think we have to do both, and we have to do them both well. I truly appreciate that. I fully agree. Um, our military readiness does not have to suffer because of sexual harassment. We can take care of that issue and also still um, be the best fighting force in the world. So uh, I appreciate your stance there. Um, I today had such a great honor. Um, I retired from the Iowa Army National Guard in 2015. And we have a number of those tremendous men and women serving right outside our doors today. And it was my honor to go out in front of the Capitol and reenlist about 15 of our Iowa Army National Guardsmen. Um, great honor for me. Uh, but uh, the importance of our National Guard has really been on display the last um, year or so as we have seen uh, numerous troops deployed in support of fighting forest fires in California for deployments and mobilization supporting COVID-19 um, activities, whether it's food distribution to food banks, making sure that vaccines were distributed to our communities. We have seen tens of thousands of our soldiers and airmen mobilized. Um, they were there, they responded, and they did it quite quickly. Uh, and I'll emphasize that point again, that the National Guard, they, they mobilized and they were there quickly, um, even beyond the capacity of their active counterparts. Um, so whether it was working for FEMA, helping those local health clinics, um, you know, distributing food, as I said, our National Guard members stepped up. And again, today, we witnessed them out on our Capitol Mall, um, keeping our nation safe so that we here in Congress can do our, our duties. So no matter what happens, whether it's response to riots or violence or other types of activities, they are mobilizing for us. And so what we have learned over the last year is that uh, they do come to us quickly in response to these domestic missions. Um, now, what further changes or reforms could be made to make sure that our National Guard are treated equally um, because of their important role for our United States, but treated equally with their active duty counterparts when it comes to training, when it comes to equipment, when it comes to readiness. Um, what can we do to make sure that they are on par with their active duty uh, counterparts? Well, there, there are, as you know, being a, having been a guard member for uh, quite some time. Uh, there are some challenges in terms of the amount of days that you have uh, to actually conduct that training. Uh, but quite frankly, you know, over the last two decades, uh, we've seen our great guard members uh, work shoulder to shoulder in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, and we've seen a, uh, we've seen a uh, a difference in the quality of equipment early on. I think we've closed that gap now. I think, uh, I think we're doing better. There's, there's more that we can do. Uh, but we're going to have to continue to work through these challenges. There no, are no easy fixes. But this is one thing that uh, I'll work with, uh, with the, uh, the services on to make sure that, that you know, we're, we are giving our guard uh, the very best, finest of equipment. We are giving them uh, uh, good quality training opportunities. Uh, and we are recognizing, recognizing them for the great work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. No, I uh, thank you for that answer. Um, they mean a lot to us in defense of our country and certainly short, uh, short notice mobilizations, especially as we see right here in Washington, D.C., um, today. So uh, last issue, because I know that we are running short on time. Um, you and I did speak briefly about defense spending and the audit uh, of our Pentagon and DOD. 
So we know that our defense budget has grown significantly to address many threats, uh, Russia and China, as well as a uh, persistent threat coming from Iran, as well as a number of much smaller uh, terrorist groups around the world. Um, so the potential for defense spending that is wasteful has also uh, grown and expanded, and it's used on lower priority or even obsolete programs. Uh, so if confirmed, how will you lead the budget reviews to reform the Pentagon, and do you see it as a possibility to make sure that the Department of Defense does obtain a clean audit? That will continue to be our goal. As you and I talked, uh, we, we have made some progress, as I understand it. I've been away from the, from the uh, from the process for a while, but but there's more to be done, and uh, and I I you have my commitment that uh, you know we will lean into this and continue to push to make sure that we can get that clean audit in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, General. My time has expired again. Thank you for stepping forward and and uh, looking to serve our nation again in this capacity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Ernst. Now via Webex, Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Austin, it was uh, good to have the chance to talk with you a little while ago. I ask all nominees before any of the committees that I sit on the following two questions as part of my responsibility to make sure that nominees are fit for uh, the appointment to which they are nominated. So I will ask you the following two questions. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement relating to this kind of conduct? No. I want to uh, acknowledge my uh, agreement with a questions asked, some of the questions asked by my colleague, Senator Blumenthal, and your commitment that, uh, that you'll be, you will counter the, any, any white supremacists or extremists within the ranks of the military. I think that's really important. Also, the questions he asked relating to how important it is to make sure that we are safe from cyber attacks because these cyber systems are what the military communications very much depend on. By the questions that were asked by several of my colleagues, including Senators Blumenthal and Gillibrand, a number of us are very concerned about the continuing scourge of sexual assault and harassment and retaliation in our military. And it is very clear that the reforms that the Department of Defense has instituted are not nearly good enough and um, much more action is needed. And I want to, uh, Expressed to you last week, a, a, a very tragic thing happened. Selena Roth, a 25 year old Army veteran and military wife, was found dead in military housing at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. A soldier is in custody and a homicide investigation is ongoing. And my heart goes out to Selena's family. Violent acts against women within our military communities continue to occur at an alarming rate. And I am committed to ensuring, to making sure that, that these perpetrators are held accountable. And you noted uh, in your statement that you will fight sexual assault and harassment in the military, including I hope that you will look at the uh, Uniform Code of Military Justice, which I support, uh, which uh, Senator Gillibrand has been a leader on, and changing the UCM, UCMJ to, uh, to remove the, the decision relating to prosecu prosecution of these kinds of attacks outside of the chain of command. I hope you will review that very carefully because all of your pre predecessors have not supported that kind of a change. I also want to mention that I've introduced the I Am Vanessa Gilliam Act. This act provides for the creation of a standalone punitive article for sexual harassment, for sexual harassment, if confirmed, would you support the creation of a standalone punitive article of sexual harassment to be included in the Uniform Code of Military Justice? Uh, Senator, anytime we, we change the Uniform Code of Military Justice, 
you know, I would want to approach that with great deliberation, but I would, I would commit to you that I would certainly want to take this on and, and look at it with the, uh, with the right experts uh, to make sure that we achieve the right effects uh, with doing something like that. But I would, I would certainly want to make sure I get the right experts at, on, on hand to, uh, to, to really uh, drill into this. Well, sexual harassment can be subsumed under other um, charges, but it is not a standalone charge. And I think it is very important considering that sexual harassment occurs at an alarming rate in the military. So um, th this is not any, any, I would hope that this is not something that requires a great deal of, uh, of thinking, because as I said, you can already charge someone uh, under other articles for sexual harassment. So um, uh, when a service member is sexually assaulted, they are given the option of either making a restricted or unrestricted report. And the I am the Venice Again Act would allow victims of sexual harassment to also make restricted reports, allowing them to remain anonymous within their chain of command while still receiving the support services that uh, they should have. Would you support the, cre the creation of a mechanism for victims of sexual harassment to be able to make a restricted report? I, I, I don't think I heard, I heard the, the, uh, the end of the question there, Senator. Would you mind re repeating the, the, uh, the, the last piece of that? Yes, would you, would you allow victims of sexual harassment to have the same options that victims of sexual assault have? And, making a restricted re report. Yes. Thank you. I want to turn to the, the importance of training areas for the Indo-Pacific area of responsibility. Admiral Davison, who is the commander of Indo-PACOM, talked recently about the importance of joint integrated training in th this uh, EOR. Admiral Davison specifically mentioned the vital importance of both the Pacific military Range Facility, or PMRF, on Kauai, and the Army Training Areas, including Pohakalua Training Range on the Big Island. With Navy, Air Force, and Army leases all up for renewal in 2029, which is really uh, right around the corner, it is incumbent on DOD to engage with state authorities and the local stakeholders, like the Native Hawaiian community, uh, early, often, and openly. Having a clear and transparent process is uh, very critical to the renewal of these leases, which, which needless to say is critical for the military's uh, presence in Hawaii. What are your thoughts on the value of realistic joint training with our coalition partners in the region and elsewhere? Well, certainly the, the, the value I, uh, of conducting joint training with our coalition partners, I mean, I, it's it's invaluable. It's uh, we always work better as a team. Uh, I think in order to be effective as a team, you, you have to train uh, to to do that every day in and day out. And so, so training is. I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. I just want to make sure that I have your commitment that you will uh, have a, an open dialogue with the community with regard to these really important training facilities in the state of Hawaii. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I do Rano. have uh, some other questions, but I believe I'm out of time. I'll submit them for the record. Thank you, Thank Senator you. Rono. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, first of all, I just want to thank you and your wife and your family for serving our nation in uniform because you did it with honor and you did it for 41 years. And I just want to say thank you for that, sir. Um, General, you and I have had the opportunity to speak now on several different occasions, and, I, and I've appreciated uh, your, your answers to my questions with regard to the waiver. Uh, I truly do believe that the waiver was there for a reason, but I also think that the president-elect does have... Um, uh, I think the tie goes to the president. And in this particular case, I believe that he has nominated you because he believes that you are the right person at the right time. I have no misgivings whatsoever about your capabilities and your competencies. 
And, and I think in this particular case, uh, it is my intent to support the waiver uh, so that you can uh, uh, have your, your uh, the presentation of you before the Senate for, for, con or for confirmation. I think part of the, the reason that I feel this way is because of the conversations that you and I had. And I, and I wanna go through them a little bit because first of all, with regard to the difference between being the Secretary of Defense and being a member of the Joint Chiefs, uh, there's a true difference between the two's, the, the role of the two. Can you share a little bit your understanding of the differences in the role, and yet at the same time, the real need for both to be expressed, and your plans with regard to bringing in, uh, as you indicated in your opening remarks, uh, additional qualified civilians into those, 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 uh, those top uh, areas. Yeah, so I, I think the the uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is uh, required to give his best military advice uh, to the president and to the secretary uh, routinely, um, and it, it's military advice. Uh, the secretary has a much broader scope. He uh, he has a lot a lot more to take into consideration. He is focused on. Uh, strategy and policy, and uh, and he understands he is working within the guidelines uh, provided by his boss, the President of the United States. Uh, so it, there is an enormous difference, uh, and I, I think um, you know one of the key uh, enablers here, as I've said uh, before, is to make sure that you know we, we have the right uh, experts, the right uh, professionals. Uh, on board, working with me day in and day out to craft that strategy and develop that policy. Uh, but the secretary has a much broader scope, and and he is not focused on giving uh, the same type of advice that the chairman uh, would would provide. Uh, I've seen this done right uh, a number of times. Uh, all the secretaries, of course, get it right. But the two that come to mind more than anyone else for me, when I was a, a three-star serving as a director of the, of the joint staff. Secretary Bob Gates was, uh, was the Secretary of Defense, an absolute master at making sure that he outlined roles and responsibilities and, 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 and swim lanes, designated swim lanes for the Joint Staff and, uh, and the OSD staff. Uh, later, uh, you know, I served on a, in the Pentagon as a four-star, as a Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, and I had a chance to work with uh, Secretary Panetta who once again was a master at making sure that those roles remained separate and that, uh, and that he provided the right kind of advice to the President of the United States. And uh, while he worked arm in arm with the, with the, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, they did not provide the same kind of perspective. And so uh, I, I fully believe that I understand the difference uh, and I look forward to uh, uh, to working with the chairman, but you know I have no desire to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and so uh, if confirmed, we'll make sure that those roles and, and responsibilities are clearly outlined. Thank you. We also had a chance to talk a little bit about um, cyber and about the work that we've done in the last couple of years with regard to cyber and the defense of our cyber operations. It used to be you had air, land, and sea to worry about. Now we clearly have space and we have cyberspace. A lot of our adversaries have decided to take the shortcut and they're trying to impact all of the other domains using cyber. In the last couple of years, particularly with regard to the 2018 DOD cyber strategy, we've decided to move forward and we have a defend forward policy. You've indicated your support or at least you've seen it, you've observed it and so forth. Can you give me very briefly your thoughts about our cyber and the need to continue to to make strides and to allow for offensive cyber operations to continue? I, I, I think that's important. I think having an offensive capability that we're able to use, I think, is, uh, is really important. And so I applaud the efforts that have been made uh, uh, in the past. I, and once again, uh, I've been away from it for a bit, but I, I really look forward to kind of getting back, getting under the hood and understanding how the, uh, how the, uh, how the processes work now to ensure coordination, you know, across the board, across the agencies, 
And, and in this, this, uh, this endeavor, speed matters. And so anything that we can do to facilitate the work of the operators, I think, is, is goodness. But we've got to make sure we're doing it in the right way. <laughs> we'll continue to remind you about the need for speed on that, if, if at all necessary. And I don't think it will be. Uh, finally, General Secretary Mattis implemented a close combat lethality task force in 2018. This is an organization dedicated to providing resources to the forces who have accounted historically for nearly 90 percent of the casualties, yet constitute only 4 percent of the force and receive only 1 percent of the institutional investments. I'm concerned with how this task force has appeared to have lost its direct report, uh, this relationship with the secretary. It appears to have gotten caught in the bureaucracy over the last year, and I would like to see it back on track. I've worked on language to strengthen the task force with Senator Duckworth and other members, and this is more than a bipartisan effort. This is a nonpartisan issue. Can you discuss the importance, um, and very briefly, of a task force that represents our infantry, Marines, special operators, and other specialties who closely and directly impact the enemy and enemy operations, and how that would be channeled through your office? Yeah, I, I, I fully understand and appreciate the importance of making sure that, that we resource and, and support uh, our men and women that are at the tip of the spear. You know, the squads and platoons are out there actually fighting the enemy. Everybody else is supporting the fight. Uh, and we, we have to make sure that they have what they need in order to be successful. This is an evolving effort. It will never remain static. And so uh, while I don't know the, the reasons for uh, things having, uh, why they have been repositioned and uh, reporting chains have been uh, uh, redesigned, I would uh, certainly take a look at that as I go in, if I'm confirmed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Austin, first off, uh, just congratulations on your nomination. And uh, thank you so much for your willingness to continue to serve this great country. One of the things I want to ask you about is, if confirmed as secretary, you're going to play a really critical role in directing defense modernization priorities that have an impact on our forces for many, many years to come. That, that modernization with critical investments in technologies like directed energy or hypersonics or artificial intelligence is what will ensure that our men and women in uniform will hopefully never experience a fair fight. But modernization requires really difficult choices with regard to competing priorities. So I wanted to ask you, how, how will you balance investments in personnel and legacy systems uh, with the critical need to develop capabilities that are going to give us a qualitative edge over near-peer adversaries like Russia and China? Well, as you know, uh, personnel costs are, are, I mean, they're, they're expensive. Yeah. And we have to be mindful about, uh, about that as we go in, as we go forward. Um, and we have to be willing to make sure that we're making the right calls, although they may be tough calls from time to time. And in terms of uh, legacy systems, uh, I think, that, you know, uh, I'll have to get in and work with the services uh, to ascertain uh, what's, you know, what they believe is relevant uh, and, uh, and really have a, a tough discussion with them on whether or not it's, it, it makes sense to continue to invest in certain types of things. But I agree with you. I think we absolutely have to invest in, uh, in the capabilities that will make us relevant, uh, not in the last fight, but in the future fight. We have to be able to understand. Uh, we have to be uh, better, faster. We have to be able to decide faster, and we, we, we have to be able to act faster. And that, that in, I mean, we'll have to employ the, the, uh, the use of space-based platforms, all the things that you talked about, the use of AI, uh, and that the, the uh, development of those kinds of capabilities uh, will not come cheap. But uh, this is not a choice, in my view. These are things that we must invest in going forward if we're going to maintain a competitive edge. Great. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, Mr. Austin, last week in the final days of the current administration, the Air Force announced that it had selected uh, Huntsville, Alabama to host the new Space Command headquarters. And I, I believe this process 
frankly, was severely flawed and, and was not in line with what I have seen historically with regard to a more deliberative approach that the Air Force has typically taken with regard to basing decisions of this mag magnitude. I know you're not familiar with this decision uh, in its details, but I would simply ask that if confirmed that you would take a close look at that process to make sure that it, that it met the, um, uh, the historical standards for decisions of that type. I'll do that, and I'll make sure that we look at all of our processes going forward so that future decisions uh, are made within the confines of the policies that have been laid out. Thank you. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, as you know, DOD has set an initial requirement uh, to produce 30 plutonium pits per year at Los Alamos Labs by 2026. I'd love your views on how important that milestone is uh, to maintaining our, our nuclear deterrent. Could you uh, repeat your question, Senator? The, the Department of Defense has set an initial requirement uh, to produce 30 plutonium pits per year at Los Alamos National Labs uh, by 2026. And I would love your, your thoughts on the importance of, of achieving that milestone on that timeline. Yeah. As we've said earlier in, this, in our discussions here uh, this afternoon, Senator, you know, uh, maintaining a, a credible, a reliable, safe, and sustainable uh, nuclear uh, capability is of utmost importance, of the highest importance. And so this is a component of that. And certainly, uh, if we've laid out those goals and objectives for ourselves, I'm very much interested in making sure that they are the appropriate goals, but, but, and I have no reason to doubt that they are, but making sure that we, are, we, we remain on time and on target with achieving those goals. I, I look forward to working with you on that front. Um, one of the last things I want to get to here in my final couple minutes is uh, PFAS cleanup and remediation. Uh, uh, many communities across the country continue to suffer from enormous impacts uh, on their water supplies from PFAS chemicals, uh, in, in particular in, in drinking water, in groundwater that's used for both drinking and in some cases agricultural use. Uh, one of the most hard hit of these communities is around Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. Uh, a community that's been incredibly supportive of that facility for decades. Uh, the Air Force and the Department of Defense more broadly have frankly slow walked the cleanup and the remediation efforts uh, for a number of years now, despite really clear evidence that, that defense activities are the source of that contamination. And if confirmed, I would ask that you make full PFAS remediation a priority within the department and ensure that the Department of Defense takes concrete steps to finally do right by these communities that have done right by the department for, for literally decades. The, the, the safety and the health of our military members, our family members, our, our DOD civilians, and our communities is very, very important to us in, in DOD. Um, I think you know that Secretary Esper uh, stood up a PFAS task force a while back, and that, that their work is ongoing. Uh, and if I'm confirmed, I'll, I'll go in and ask that they pick up the pace on the work. Uh, and, uh, and we want to push to make sure that, that we have uh, good solutions for mitigation of, uh, of our contribution uh, to, to this, this contamination. And PFAS has been used uh, throughout the economy, so I think we're going to have to work across the, uh, you know, across the board with our partners to ensure that, you know, we're working together, we're doing the right things to mitigate uh, the effects here. So I look forward to working with uh, my, colleague, my colleague there in the, in the EPA to make sure that, uh, you know, the military is doing its part and we stay focused on the right things here. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Heinrich, Senator Tillis, and uh, Senator Rounds presiding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Austin, can you hear me okay? I, I can. Uh, congratulations to you and, and to your wife and your family, and thank you for your decades of service. I, um, I'd like to start by, uh, well, also I want to thank you for spending some quality time down at Fort Bragg at the tip of the spear with the 82nd Airborne. Um, 
I want to associate myself with comments made by Senators Gillibrand, Ernst, and Blumenthal on military sexual assault. I don't expect you to respond to it. I, I heard your, your responses earlier, but to, uh, to me, we'll never know what great leaders chose never to go into the military if we continue to have a reputation for a culture that's not making progress on military sexual assault. I've heard you make commitments to my uh, colleagues, and I look forward to exploring this issue as a ranking member on the personnel subcommittee. <laughs> but we've got a lot of work to do. I've been here for six years and we're not making near enough progress. Um, I'd like to start though by asking you to give me an idea of the general, a general overview of the threat that you believe that Iran uh, represents to uh, national security and security in the Middle East. And I'll also be curious in, in your answer, what you think about the recent agreements with Middle East countries and Israel, whether or not that's a positive step in the right direction. Iran continues to be a destabilizing element in the region. Um, if you look at its behavior, uh, it, uh, it clearly, uh, every, uh, a lot of activity that's, that's destabilizing. It doesn't work well with its, uh, with its neighbors. Uh, it, uh, uh, again, does present uh, a threat to, uh, uh, to our partners in the region and those forces that we have uh, stationed in the region. Uh, if Iran were ever to, to get a nuclear capability, uh, most every problem that we deal with in the region would be uh, tougher to deal with because of that. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, I think Iran's activity, uh, it continues to be, or its, its behavior is, continues to be destabilizing. Um, and on the uh, recent agreements, do you have any opinion as to whether or not they're a positive step to try and uh, check Iran's uh, ambitions in the Middle East? I, I do. I, I, I think that any time that we, you know, that uh, countries agree to, uh, to normalize relations, I think that's a good thing. And I think certainly uh, this has put a bit more pressure on Iran, and I hope it will have good effects. Uh, thank you, General Austin. General Austin, you wrote in your advanced policy responses, uh, this is a quote from them, the continued erosion of U.S. military advantage vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia in key strategic areas remains the most significant risk the department must address. If left unchecked, this continued erosion could fundamentally change our ability to achieve U.S. national security objectives and limit the DOD's ability to underpin other U.S. instruments of power. Um, can you talk a little bit about the key, the key strategic areas? Um, you know, we've long since thought that they had a quantitative advantage, but that we maintain a qualitative advantage. It seems like the margins are shrinking. So can you give me a brief expansion on the responses to the advanced policy questions? Uh, thanks, Senator. They've continued to invest in modernization. Um, they've, uh, they've gone to school on us in terms of, you know, how we deploy and how we employ our forces. Uh, and so if we uh, would choose to do the same types of things that we've done in the past, uh, I think that uh, we will clearly be challenged. Uh, so we'll have to have uh, capabilities uh, that allow us to hold, uh, uh, to present a credible threat, a credible deterrent, excuse me, uh, to China in the future. We'll have to make, uh, uh, make some strides in, uh, in you know, the use of uh, quantum computing, the use of AI, the use of connect, uh, the, uh, the advent of connected battlefields, uh, space-based platforms. Uh, those kinds of things, I think, can give us the types of capabilities uh, that we'll need to be able to hold a large element, a large pieces of uh, uh, Chinese, the, the Chinese inventory, military inventory at risk. Uh, and so uh, I, I believe that we still have, uh, you know, the, the qualitative edge and uh, the competitive edge uh, over China. I think that gap has closed significantly. And our goal will be to ensure that, that we expand that, uh, that gap going forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, because I have limited time, I'm going to submit a question to the record on, I think, the economic warfare that we're dealing with on China, uh, the race to 5G, 
and some of the interagency um, activities that I don't think the DOD is prominently up there. We've got UST, the USTR Commerce Department, but I feel like that we're losing some ground. I have a unique perspective on that, looking at all the intellectual property theft as the uh, chair of the intellectual property subcommittee on judiciary, but I've got a lot of uh, context I want to add to that, so I won't ask the question there. So, in my remaining time, I would, if I were in person, I would have my 600-page request for proposal for the next generation handgun uh, with me. It's my favorite prop when I go, uh, when we have a confirmation like this. And I, I would, I, it, it just confounds me to think it took 10 years to procure the next generation handgun, and it's going to take 10 years to deploy it. To me, it suggests the fundamental problem with the way we go about acquisitions and procurements in the Department of Defense. Um, so I would just seek your commitment, if confirmed, if you're going to have the kind of resources around you that are going to drill down across the business of the DOD and figure out if we're now at a point to where we can go from an investigational new drug to a, an approved vaccine in 11 months, it would seem to me that we could get to a point where we can specify certain procurements in the DOD in uh, terms of months or years, not decades. Do I have your commitment to make sure that you make this a priority, that you have someone there that has the experience and insight to figure out how we get more productivity and I think more sanity in our procurement processes? You have my commitment, Senator. Well, thank you, General Austin, and thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the Chairman, Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and General Austin. Congratulations on the nomination. Um, ten years after the Civil War finished, at the end of his second term as president, U.S. Grant gave a speech in Des Moines, Iowa, September 1875. Here's what he said talking about the prospect of ever having another civil war. If we are to have another contest in the near future of our national existence, I predict that the dividing line will not be Masons and Dixons, but between patriotism and intelligence on the one side and superstition, ambition, and ignorance on the other. Those words are very chilling words as we contemplate what we saw in this Capitol on the 6th of January. We saw ambition. We saw superstition, if you could say superstition might be QAnon fantasy or election was stolen or widespread spread voter fraud. Ignorance. I don't know that I'd use that word. The speech that U.S. Grant gave was to a group of Civil War veterans, and it was to promote the idea of more broad public education, the idea that education would drive out susceptibilities of superstition. It might be comforting for us to think that what we saw on January 6th or generally was ignorance, but if you look at the spectrum of people who were involved, you find a number of very highly educated people. Um, sadly, and I know this has been raised already, you find a lot of people who have connection to our military, um, who should be, as part of the enormous training investment we make in them, be able to spot the difference between truth and fantasy, between reality and conspiracy theory. Military Times did an analysis in 2019, a survey of active duty military, and they found that 36% of active duty service members have seen evidence of white supremacist and racist ideologies in the military. That doesn't mean 36% of military share those, but more than one-third of our military have seen their colleagues exhibiting either white supremacist or racist ideologies. General Austin, if you're confirmed, you will make history as the first African-American Secretary of Defense, but you've also lived a life in this country and seen these challenges. I know some colleagues have asked you about investigations, but what I, what I would like to ask you about is training. We invest so much to train a member of our military, officer, enlisted. What might you suggest to us as we think about the training going forward that would lead us to have a military that was immune from superstition and not so gullible as to fall for these false ideologies? 
I, I, uh, thanks, Senator. I, I, I think that we have to train our leaders uh, to make sure that they are in touch with the people that they are leading, that they understand who they are, you know, what they're, what they're doing, what they're, what they're reading, uh, that they're looking at their environment that they're living in and looking for signs of things that could, uh, could indicate that something is, is going in the wrong direction. I think, our, I think leadership needs to, if, if leadership is not in touch with the people they're leading, these kinds of things can happen. And I don't think that, uh, that this is a thing that, uh, that you can put a Band-Aid on and fix and leave alone. I think that training needs to go on, you know, routinely uh, because things change. Uh, the, the types of things that you're looking for change. I think our leaders need to be able to talk to their, their subordinates and, and instill in them the right types of values uh, the values that our military embraces, the values that our country embraces, uh, and, you know, failure to be able to adhere to those values means that you shouldn't be a part of our formation. Uh, and our leaders need to be able to sort, sort uh, those things out. But having had personal experience with this, being in a unit that had a problem with this long ago when I was a lieutenant colonel, I can tell you that you know, most of us were embarrassed that we didn't know what to look for, and and we didn't we didn't really understand that by being engaged more with your people on these types of issues uh, can pay big dividends. I, I know that that pro, that unit has probably learned that forever, but but I I don't think that uh, you can ever take your hand off the steering wheel here. Well, because because in a way, um, the enemy within, disunity is probably the most destructive force in terms of our ability to defend ourselves. If we're divided against one another, how can we defend the nation? I view this as an enormously important task that you will carry should you be confirmed. I want to echo what comments that have been made by colleagues about military sexual assault. Again, a divider within the body that makes us less able to externally face and, and defeat the threats we face. I read the, much of the uh, citizen review panel that was put together to look at the uh, tragic murder of Vanessa Gillen at Fort Hood. And uh, that is a very, very powerful document, and I would encourage all members of the committee to do it. I spoke to one of the members of that panel, and he relayed that he was doing one of the interviews. They did dozens and dozens of interviews and was talking to, you know, a mid-level officer on the base who was trying to say that they felt like they were doing all they could to deal with military sexual assault. And the, and the interviewer said, would you let your daughter serve in the military? He said, no way. He just Rorschach answered the question and said, no way. And whatever the attempt to put a, spin, a good spin on how we're doing, if you would worry about your own daughter serving in the military, we got a long ways to go. Um, quality of life issues are enormously important. Um, you've been asked about a lot of the strategic challenges. We've faced this tough one on military housing. And I just want to remind my colleagues, we started, we, we faced that military housing issue about two years after we did significant reforms to reduce the size of headquarters staff. And what we found as we were kind of asleep at the switch and monitoring military housing, an awful lot of the staffs that oversaw military housing had been dramatically shrunk because of what we did on the headquarters staff thing. That doesn't mean that there isn't fat that could be squeezed out of any organization. It just means that we have to really be careful thinking if we shrink the civilian side or the headquarters side, we're going to be saving some money, which we did, but we ended up compounding a problem. And I hope you will be uh, attuned to the need to balance um, challenges like that so that we can provide the quality of life that our men and women and their families deserve and that we'll keep them re-enlisting if we want them to. If you could just say a word about that and I'm done. Yeah, I, I, I will. I'll be certainly uh, very attuned to that, Senator. I think in some cases we've broken trust with our, our, our family members because of the housing issue and other issues. I think this is critically important. I look forward to being able to work with, uh, with the uh, services uh, to really uh, not only get after this, the immediate problems, but you know, fi put the fixes in our contracting efforts so that uh, you know, we're much better at this uh, down the road.
Th th thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On behalf of the Chairman, Senator Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General, uh, General Billy Mitchell, the father of the U.S. Air Force, in a hearing like this in front of the Armed Services many years ago, and then actually I think it was in the 1930s, called Alaska the most strategic place in the world. I like to say Alaska constitutes three pillars of America's military might. We are the cornerstone of missile defense. Almost all the missiles and radar systems protecting the entire country are in Alaska. We are the hub of air combat power for the Arctic and Asia Pacific. We'll have over 100 Fifth gen fighters there, we're building up our tanker capability, an issue that I think is going to be important. And we're a platform for expeditionary forces like the 425, the 1st Striker Brigade. If confirmed, can I get your commitment soon and your tenure to come to Alaska with me and see this uh, critically important national defense state and troops for uh, America and my state? Senator, I absolutely agree with you that Alaska is a, is a, a national treasure, and it has it holds some of our most important uh, uh, military uh, assets and resources. Uh, as as you know, we are challenged with travel now, and uh, and as uh, the opportunities present themselves, uh, you know, post trips to uh, to the Indo Pacific, where we need to, I need to get to right away if I'm confirmed. Uh, I certainly would accept your invitation at some point in the future. Well, General, a lot of us think that Alaska is kind of the, in the Indo-Pacific. So uh, on your way out, we can get there early. So I look forward to doing that. Um, related to that is the issue of national security in the Arctic. And that's a certainly a new theater of great power competition, Russia, China being very aggressive. Uh, in the Arctic with massive buildups of military forces, infrastructure. To be honest, for the last several years, I think the Pentagon was asleep at the switch with regard to our national security challenges in the Arctic. This committee, in a bipartisan way, has been very focused on ensuring that the Pentagon recognizes these challenges um, with infrastructure, icebreakers that we need, capabilities. The Department of Defense released its Arctic strategy in June 2019, required by this committee. Uh, the Air Force followed suit with its own strategy in July of 2020. The Department of the Navy just this week published its Arctic strategic blueprint, and the Army will soon be doing this as well. Can I get your commitment to work with this committee, where this has been a high priority, to ensure that these service Arctic strategies are appropriately resourced and that we can protect our strategic interest in the Arctic? You have my commitment, Senator. Thank you. Um, General, the other issue I just wanted to touch on here uh, in this hearing that we had last week on civilian control of the military and op-eds, you're seeing it with some of my colleagues, there's been this growing conventional wisdom that somehow because Secretary Mattis had been a previous CENTCOM commander, that his tenure is a warning, really, for what some are considering a failed tenure as Secretary of Defense. I actually disagree with this uh, quite vehemently. Uh, Secretary Mattis replaced uh, Secretary of Defense, Secretary Carter, with no military experience. As a matter of fact, he was what many people are calling for, a political secretary, um, I supported both, but let me just give you a little juxtaposition. Secretary Carter oversaw a 25% cut in military funding. Readiness plummeted. Secretary Mattis rebuilt this up and rebuilt met a readiness with this Congress. Secretary Carter would not support arming uh, the Ukrainians with Javelin missile systems, despite the entire s committee here pressing him to do so. Um, Secretary Mattis did that almost immediately in his tenure. Secretary Carter watched ISIS grow uh, to be a very lethal threat. Secretary Mattis brought DOD strategy to crush ISIS. Secretary Carter, for a whole host of reasons, was very reluctant to press for any freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. Uh, Secretary Mattis made those regular elements of our strategy 
in the Asia Pacific. And finally, Secretary Mattis put together the National Defense Strategy, one of the most important and bipartisan documents uh, that many have seen on national security in a generation. Uh, he often got back to senators quickly uh, in terms of oversight. With all due respect to Secretary Carter, sometime it took weeks just to schedule a phone call or a meeting. So, General Austin, do you think Secretary Mattis had a failed tenure as Secretary of Defense because he had previously served as CENTCOM commander? I'd like your assessment of that. It's being used right now as somehow uh, a warning for your confirmation, and I think it's a conventional wisdom that I personally reject. I, I do not think he, he should be considered as a failed Secretary of Defense because of his his work in CENTCOM earlier. I think, uh, you know, Secretary Mattis was a very thoughtful uh, uh, secretary, and uh, he did a lot of goodness for the department. And, you know, certainly I would not want to evaluate his, role, his, uh, his tenure as secretary. I have great respect for him. Uh, as you know, I've served alongside him. Uh, I've worked uh, with him on a number of tough issues. Uh, and I watched from afar as he was secretary. So I have no reason to believe that his, his role at, or his tenure at CENTCOM made his, uh, his tenure at, at, or diminished his role as, uh, as a Secretary of Defense. And that wouldn't be a lesson or reflection on what you will be able to accomplish uh, in the department as well. People are using that uh, as a, a warning, so to speak. Uh, and I think it's, it, I, I do not think that that's a, that's a fair uh, uh, assessment. And I would say also, uh, Senator, that we are completely different people, as yeah. you know. You know us both. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, I will absolutely do the things that, uh, that we've talked about in this hearing, you know, get the, the right civilians in the right positions to, uh, to help me uh, exercise uh, civilian control of the military. Uh, and I'll make sure that we have the very best experts focused on our toughest issues, like, uh, you know, the China issue, uh, the, uh, uh, the issue of uh, our acquisition reform, uh, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, just one, one final uh, um, question. General, I just want you to have the opportunity to answer two other criticisms. One, that uh, you have not had experience in the Asia-Pacific and two, that with uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs being an Army General, that somehow uh, your tenure with General Milley would be favoring the Army. Can you uh, quickly address those two criticisms that have come about your nomination? Well, I'll take the last one first, uh, Senator. Uh, you know, if you look at my history, I spent a lot of time in joint assignments, uh, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, uh, as a director of the Joint Staff, as, uh, as a commander of Central Command, you know, I, I, have, I know as many sailors and, and, uh, and airmen as I do soldiers. I mean, I, I, uh, if you look at uh, the, the folks that I've worked with over the past. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of being able to, uh, uh, to focus adequately on the issue of China, the reason that I, I, w I was focused on the Middle East for some, uh, quite some time was because that was the most important thing for our country. And so we, we put our, our best equipment towards that effort, our best people, and uh, it was absolutely necessary at the time. But if confirmed, you can expect that I'll, uh, I'll put a laser-like focus on develop, de developing the right capabilities, plans, operational concepts, uh, that, that'll ensure that we maintain a competitive edge uh, you know, as we look at ourselves with respect to China. Uh, Thank you. We will present a credible deterrent uh, to China and any other adversary that looks to take us on. Uh, Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Your time has expired. Uh, via WebEx, Senator King is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, Mr. Austin, thank you very much for your testimony. As you can see, uh, perhaps I'm on the road. You've taken me today from just south of the George Washington Bridge to the George Washington Parkway, so uh, I'm almost there. Uh, first, I want to associate myself with uh, uh, two particular comments by my uh, 
my colleagues. One on the issue of the Arctic raised by Senator Sullivan, incredibly uh, strategic area, an area of, of enormous importance and developing importance. And one of the things about the Arctic is we've been able to work cooperatively with Russia on most Arctic matters, and yet they're moving very rapidly toward militarization. So I commend uh, that area to you for attention. The Navy just real, uh, released a new Arctic strategy. So a very important issue. The other issue is procurement that Senator Tillis mentioned. Uh, the whole idea of uh, 10 years for a handgun and a 600 page spec, uh, we just can't do that. Uh, uh, we, we need to be more uh, agile uh, particularly in this day and age where technology is so important in terms of our ability to defend the country. So uh, those two things I do commend to your attention uh, when, when and if you are uh, confirmed. Now, I, at the beginning of the hearing, there's a lot of talk about uh, civilian control of the military. One of the problems uh, is, Mr. Austin, that tomorrow when David Norquist assumes the, the uh, title of acting uh, secretary, he will be the 10th secretary or acting secretary in 10 years. And the last secretary to serve more than two years was Bob Gates, and he left in 2011. So when you have a joint staff that has continuity and a civilian side that manifestly lacks continuity, I think that's one of the one of the areas where we can try to move to shore up uh, civilian control of the military. So I guess my question is, are your bags unpacked and are you prepared to move your loyalties from the Falcons and the, and the Braves to the Nationals and the Washington football team? We want you to stay a while, uh, Mr. Austin, if you're, uh, if you're confirmed. Uh, you can absolutely count on me staying a while if I'm confirmed, Senator. And, and by the way, my wife is a, is a native of this area of DC, so uh, it didn't, I mean, my bags, are, my bags are already unpacked, but to your, to the point that you're making, I'm absolutely committed to making sure that we, uh, we're doing the, doing the right things for the long haul. I, I appreciate that. Uh, to change the subject, uh, somewhat in 2018, you gave, a, a, an interview where you discussed the importance of coalitions as being one of the key elements of modern conflict. And, uh, Churchill once said, the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without allies. Can you expand a bit on your views about coalitions and how and what we need to do to shore up uh, our relationships with our allies? No, I, I truly believe, and I believe this uh, in my heart, that we, we perform better when we're operating as a part of a team. And... Uh, and throughout in, in all of the operations that I've participated in that are major operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, the, the counter, ISIL camp, uh, counter ISIS campaign uh, and so many other things, you know, our allies brought valuable capability and capacity uh, uh, to the fight. Uh, and I, I truly believe that, you know, it's, you, you can't just show up and fight and be effective. I think that you know, these relationships have to be developed. You have to train, work, and live together in, in a lot of cases uh, in order to have an effective, uh, incredible fighting force. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, uh, fighting as a part of a team, as a as part of a coalition, is absolutely uh, a part of who we are, something that we treasure. And if confirmed, I'll look forward to reestablishing some of the critical uh, partnerships and alliances that we've had and, and working with our allies uh, to make sure that, uh, that you know, we, we keep them on board as, as we move forward fast. Well, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. The way I'd like to put it briefly is that you have to have the relationship before the ask. I, I absolutely agree with that, uh, Senator. Now, we're, we're turning our attention and have been for the last several years to the Asia Pacific and particularly to China. And I've asked a question of a number of people that have appeared before this committee. I'd like your thoughts on what does China want? What do you believe China's strategic goals are? Are they looking to be uh, the dominant 
world power, a regional hegemon, an economic power? What is their what what are their goals? Because it seems to me, in order to determine how we best counter or uh, cooperate, uh, we need to understand where they're headed. Yeah, I think it's all of that. They're, they're they're already a regional hegemon, and I think their goal is to be a dominant world power, and uh, and. Uh, they are working across the spectrum to compete with us in a number of areas, uh, and it will take a whole-of-government approach to uh, to push back on their efforts uh, in, in a credible way. Not to say that we won't see things uh, down the road that, that are in our best interest uh, that we can cooperate with China on. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do things that are in our best interest, uh, but... Certainly, some of the things that we've seen from them in recent past in terms of coercive behavior in the region and, and around the globe uh, tend, to, tend to make us believe that uh, they really want to be a dominant world power. Finally, uh, and I don't really have time for a long answer, but I just want to commend to you with the issue of cyber. Two years ago, this committee led the creation in the National Defense Act of something called the Cyber Solarium Commission, uh, which I was honored to serve upon, uh, along with a bipartisan group from the Congress and the private sector and the executive. Uh, I would commend to you our report, which was released last March, talks a lot about the issues we've talked about today. As you know, and as Senator Rounds mentioned, the, the area of cyber is not a potential area of conflict. It is a current area of conflict. and. Uh, I will be sure that uh, we get a copy of the report to you and you can take a look at it because part of it is structure, but also part of it is policy, deterrence, uh, resilience. And uh, I think that this is something that uh, obviously we need to uh, attend to. You have General Nakasone, who is crucial in this effort. Uh, and uh, I look forward to working with you on those issues as well. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Austin. and. Uh, uh, congratulations on your testimony today. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the chairman, Senator Kramer. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Thank you, General, for um, your decades of service and your willingness to continue in this new way. And congratulations to both you and your wife and, and your entire family. Um, first of all, I, I want to tell you how pleased I was with the very specific answer of uh, affirming um, the chairman's question related to your support for a nuclear triad that includes um, the platforms of land, air, and sea as, as specified in the chairman's favorite book, um, The National Defense Strategy. That was very helpful to me, and I appreciate that. I appreciated the conversation we had about it and several other things uh, last week as well. With that specific answer to that specific question in mind, I want to drill down a little bit on just one of those three legs. As you know, as we talked about um, Minot has two of the three legs. It's the only place in the country that has two of the three legs of the triad. Um, you were asked, of course, you did in, in the, uh, the qualified questions, the previous questions, um, you were asked about the assessment of, of past secretaries of defense. And you, you said this, you said, I agree that nuclear deterrence is the department's highest priority mission and that updating and overhauling our nation's nuclear forces is a critical national security priority. Um, today you specified the words um, triad. In your advanced policy question response, though, you did, in referencing the aging nuclear deterrent, you chose the words overhaul and updating, but you never used the word replace. And I don't know if that was simply a, an error or an omission or if it was strategic, but you did say U.S. nuclear weapons have been extended far beyond their original service lives. And as uh, Senator Fisher earlier, she quoted um, Admiral, Admiral Richard of, of uh, Stratcom. I'm going to quote him now in a different quote where he said, you cannot life extend Minuteman 3. It is getting past the point where it's not cost effective to life extend Minuteman 3, unquote. But you're going to get a lot of pressure from organizations, good folks, um, some members of Congress, maybe some on, on an Armed Services Committee, either here on the other side of the Capitol, to delay the ground-based strategic deterrent. 
um, the replacement of Minuteman 3, and maybe even shrink it. Um, do you think that we can extend the life of Minuteman 3, even if the, the, uh, that means unilaterally decreasing our nuclear deterrent? Well, I, you know, I think I may have indicated to you before that, that in order to, to really answer this question, uh, uh, I, I really need to sit down with not only the STRATCOM commander, but also sit down and take a look at where we are in that modernization effort and, and what choices are being proposed and the rationale for, the, for them. Uh, and I have not had the ability to do that uh, to this point, Senator Kramer, but when I do, I, I would love to have that discussion with you. Well, and I'd look forward to that. And on your way to uh, Indo-PACOM, um, before you get to Alaska, you could just stop in mind it. We'll have the talk right there if it works. But anyway, um, Senator Sullivan thinks the Arctic starts and ends in Alaska, and I just like to remind him every now and then there's there's other land between here and there. Anyway, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that the Iran nuclear deal, and there have been some questions about Iran, but under the 2015 agreement, the restrictions on Iran's uranium enrichment sunset uh, beginning in 2025, and, and that's obviously only four years from now, and so I want to know, in your view, are the risks of entering an agreement um, under the same conditions that would allow Iran to significantly increase its uranium enrichment only four years from now? I mean, what, what would some of the risks of that be, do you think? Well, I, I would hope, and I think the president-elect has been clear that, uh, you know, the, the preconditions for us considering to re-enter into, uh, into, into that agreement would be that Iran uh, meet the conditions outlined in the agreement. So back to, uh, back to where they should have been. Um, I, I would hope that a as we enter into that, that agreement, we could have uh, this discussion about, uh, about, you know, when things sunset and also take a look at some broader things uh, that may or may not be a part of this treaty, but certainly uh, things that I think need to be addressed, and one of those things is ballistic, miss ballistic missiles. Very good. Thank you. You anticipated, or at least you answered my, my next question. I appreciate that. Um, another area that you and I discussed quite a bit was uh, ISR. And, of course, you'd know more than a little bit about that, given your, your background, particularly um, at CENTCOM, of course. And there's been a lot of cutting of legacy programs recently to help pay for more advanced programs and technology uh, in the future. And, and uh, it's, a lot of times there are, we're confronted with either-or um, challenges, but sometimes we have to do all the above as well. Um, a lot of these cuts are, have been, of course, to ISR programs like the RQ4 Global Hawk, uh, and the MQ-9 Reaper that, again, you've depended on a lot at CENTCOM. Do you think we can strategically afford to cut back ISR to places like the Middle East, um, Africa, South America even, and, and, and to some degree even the Pacific, while we you know, save up money for, for future missions? Well, I, I think our, you know, as we look at our global force posture, it's one of the things I, I really want to have the opportunity to, to do and look at our requirements versus where our forces are postured. Um, our focus is going to be, as we've talked earlier, in making sure that we have what we need in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but in terms of the Sentinel forces that are required by the CENTCOM commander, uh, I really would like to see what, what uh, he thinks his requirements are, what, what the threat, threats are that, uh, that he need, needs to stay abreast of, and that sort of business. But, most likely, there will be some, uh, some requirement for those types of capabilities going forward. Uh, the Air Force certainly has a, a strong voice in this in terms of what they can afford to keep on uh, you know, in light of the investments that they're making in modernization. So, again, pretty complex uh, uh, equation that we'll have to tackle, but, uh, but certainly I look forward to, to taking it on. Thank you, Confirm. General. Thank you, Chairman. I'm out of time, or I would have asked you about the uh, $40 billion pass-through budget at the, um, the Air Force, but we can talk about that another time. Thank you. On behalf of the Chairman, Senator Warren. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. General Austin, I very much appreciated the opportunity to speak with you a few weeks ago, and 
As I told you when we talked then, I believe we have to do a lot more to end the cozy relationship between the Pentagon and the defense industry. And over the years, I proposed a number of legal changes in this area. Now, since 2016, you've served on the board of Raytheon Technologies and uh, its predecessor, United Technologies, which is one of the largest defense contractors in the nation. I am very pleased to hear that you've pledged that you will extend your recusal from matters involving Raytheon for four years and that you're not going to seek a waiver from those recusals. Do I have that right? Uh, Senator, I, I can make the commitment to you that I will extend my uh, recusal for Raytheon. And I certainly appreciated the opportunity to discuss these issues with you. As you are aware, what you've asked goes uh, beyond what's required by law. And I'm making Absolutely. This, I'm making this commitment uh, because I recognize the unique circumstances here that you've you've highlighted. Raytheon yeah. is I, of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Raytheon is one of the world's largest defense contractors, and I'm sensitive to the appearance uh, concerns that you raise in this particular situation. And with respect to the issue of seeking a waiver, I, I do not expect to do that or to need one. But if such an unanticipated circumstance were to arise, uh, I would consider av available alternatives to a waiver before seeking one and would consult very carefully with uh, agency ethics officials. And okay. If I'm privileged enough to be confirmed, I can pledge to you that I'll be mindful not only of the legal requirements that govern my conduct, but also of the appearances to ensure that the public has no reason to question my impartiality, and I'll consult with the DOD career ethics officials on these issues and will require everyone that, re that serves with me to ensure that public service is and will remain a public trust. Well, I, I very much appreciate that. And if I can, let me just ask one more aspect of this. You know, I've also called for new laws to prevent contractors from hiring senior government officials who leave federal service for a period of years, again, to help eliminate the appearance of trading on government service to help improve, it, the idea is to try to help improve public trust in our leaders. So let me ask you about that after you leave. Are you willing to make any commitments on that? Well, I have, uh, I do not ex intend to seek employment as a lobbyist or sit on the board of a defense contractor like Raytheon after my service. Quite frankly, I'll be too old to sit on a board of uh, a defense contractor after my service. But I have, uh, I, I have no intent to be a lobbyist uh, as well. All right. Well, I just want you to know, I really do appreciate that, General. Going above and beyond what federal law requires, as you are doing here, sends a powerful message that you are working on behalf of the American people and no one else. Now, I want to try to focus, if I can, on defense spending. But before I do, I just want to say a very quick word about military housing. Two years ago, this committee heard horror stories from military families about mold, termites, lead paint, other terrible conditions at military houses managed by private for-profit companies. The military has a responsibility to oversee these contracts, and this committee passed some sweeping reforms, increasing oversight powers, but I am still hearing from families who say that their situation is not substantially improving. So, General Austin, can I ask for your public commitment on two things? First, to respond to my request for information about what's going on, and second, to pledge that you're gonna make fixing this problem a priority. Uh, I absolutely will respond to your request for information, if confirmed, uh, and this has been a priority of mine and will always be a priority of mine. So I look forward to working with the services on, uh, on this issue. I think, as I said earlier, in some cases, we've broken trust with some of our family members. Yeah, so thank you very much. I'm, I'm gonna hold you that commitment. I really appreciate it, General. 
A few weeks ago, Congress passed the annual defense authorization and appropriations bill that allocated over $740 billion to the Department of Defense. Now, that's more than President Reagan spent during the height of the Cold War. It's more than the federal government spends on the rest of the discretionary budget combined. In fact, it's more than the next 10 nations combined spend on defense, and most of those countries are our allies. The money that Congress appropriated a few weeks ago also comes on top of what we spent on two decades of endless wars in the Middle East that cost roughly $6.4 trillion and killed more than 7,000 American service members and did very little to make America safer. Now, General Austin, you've been nominated to lead the Defense Department, so I'm not expecting you to start out your job by turning down the money that Congress just gave you. But I want to ask you a different question. Do you agree that protecting our nation is not just about how much money our nation spends on defense, but also about how we spend it and what specific challenges we focus on? I do. My, my, you know, as, as a Secretary of Defense, uh, job one for me is a defense of this country. And, and we're going to do uh, what it takes to make sure that we're successful at that. As we talked earlier, you know, our strategy, our resources ought to match our strategy, and our strategy ought to match our policy. And, uh, and so, uh, again, I, I think we have a I have a requirement to be good stu stewards of a good steward of our resources. Uh, but you can count on me always asking for what, what, uh, what we need to accomplish the strategy that's been laid out for us. Well, I, I appreciate the approach that looks at how we're spending that money and exactly what challenges we're focusing our money on. I see that I'm out of time, so I'm not going to get to ask you about the importance of investing in our diplomatic corps and making sure that we have adequate funding for the State Department in order to help you in the defense of our nation. I promise, though, I'll send you some questions for the record about that. Uh, Thank you easy, very much. Easy answer for me, Senator. I think it's absolutely important that the State Department be resourced adequately. Good. That's what I like to hear. Thank you, General. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Warren. And now, via WebEx, uh, Senator Scott. All right, thanks. Chairman, can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you, Chairman, for holding this meeting. Uh, first off, I want to thank General Austin for our, all of his hard work. We had the opportunity to work together when he was at CENTCOM. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to thank the General for his distinguished service as a, a soldier and a commander, and just what a great do job he did uh, in, the mil in the military. So I'm very, very appreciative. We had, we had the opportunity to talk the other day, and, and so if you could um, talk a little bit about um, how, you know, if you look at the people in the military have just ha had not spend a whole bunch of time dealing with uh, the risk of communist China and how you'll get up to speed because we don't, we actually don't have, um, it's the same experience in dealing with communist China as we do with people in the middle, dealing with the, uh, the Middle East. So General Oscar, can you talk a little bit about how you'll get up to speed and how important you think it is to get up to speed on the risk of communist China? Well, I, I think it's absolutely important, as I outlined uh, in my uh, in my opening statement, Senator Scott. I think China is is uh, our most uh, challenging, um, our most significant challenge uh, going forward. Uh, and so you can expect that uh, I'll uh, uh, continue to uh, focus the resources of the department on this issue to make sure that. Uh, that we're prepared to meet any challenge and that we continue to present a credible deterrent to China or any other um, uh, aggressor who would uh, want to take us on and convince them that that would be a really bad idea. Uh, the issue of China, though, is, is, is very complex, uh, and I fully recognize that, you know, while I have the military component of this, of this problem set, it's a whole-of-government approach because China it looks to compete with us along a spectrum of activities, you know, economic and, and, uh, and IT and cyber and, and space and, and, and other domains. Uh, so, uh, you know, we'll have the right experts. We'll have the right uh, uh, capabilities and, and plans and, and operational concepts uh, that are required to make sure that we're uh, effective uh, in our efforts to uh, deter China and any other aggressor. 
Thank you, General Austin. So, um, you know, you and in, in your military career, you did a great job of building teams uh, from the people I've I've heard, including Senator Sullivan. You um, you built a great team to to get the results you wanted, and you're going to have to in this job in this role, you have to do the exact same thing. So, how are you going to be able to vet the people that uh, will be working with you uh, to make sure that they share your view on the importance of holding uh, Communist China accountable? And and actually make sure we have we ha we are a great deterrent uh, to their ambition to dominate at, at, the, at a minimum uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Well, certainly I'll I'll issue the you know I'll make sure that I issue the the appropriate guidance to focus the department's efforts on uh, on this issue, and we'll make sure that the right po uh, processes and procedures are in, are in place to review our efforts and to coordinate our efforts to make sure that. We're, uh, we're operating as a, as a joint force. And you, you mentioned teams, and part of the team effort here is obviously and certainly with our allies. Uh, I think it's really important to make sure that, uh, that you know, we continue to reach out to our allies. We build the capacity necessary to, uh, uh, to be effective against China. And those allies can include, certainly include the people in the region, but they also include allies around the rest of the globe. Uh, so... Uh, I'll, we'll issue the right uh, uh, guidance and we'll have the right policies in place and the right mechanisms to make sure that uh, we're, we're operating as, a, as, a, uh, as a, a joint force and that we're focused appropriately in acquiring uh, the right technologies uh, to make sure that we're relevant going forward. Do, uh, do you believe that with the Biden administration, you'll have the opportunity to have influence on the people that will be part of your team uh, internally uh, to make sure that they uh, share your view on the importance of holding Communist China accountable? I absolutely believe that, Senator Scott. Okay. And, you know, what, one thing that uh, Senator Sullivan brought up to me when I uh, spoke to him yesterday about you was the, um, the fact that, you know, with your, with your military background, you'll be one of the a few individuals in the Biden administration that will have the military background. Do you, do you believe you'll, you'll have the ability to influence their uh, influence uh, and, and, and convince them the importance of having a strong military to be able to be a great deterrent uh, and a great promoter of world peace? I, I do, Senator Scott. I also believe that, uh, you know, I have a great relationship with the uh, president, uh, president elect, and I certainly would, would like to be able to express my uh, my views to him uh, as frequently as necessary. One of the issues we deal with is the ambiguity with regard to Taiwan. Um, I think a lot of us believe that you know, Taiwan is is worth uh, making sure that we can uh, continue help help them continue as a democracy and as and as uh, an entity independent of communist China. Well, how you know? I I I, I personally believe we've got to. Quit being ambiguous, and we got to let people, let Communist China know the importance of Taiwan to us. And how would you do that to make sure that we're not sitting here uh, down the road having to make a decision oh, that uh, Communist China has decided to invade Taiwan? Yeah, well, certainly our efforts will be uh, to ensure that we do everything to uh, make sure that China doesn't take that decision. Um, but our our support to um, Taiwan has been rock solid over the years, and it's been bipartisan support. And I would certainly want to thank this committee uh, for for their support and their uh, willingness to work together on this issue. Um, you know, we've uh, uh, we've been strong on our commitments, and uh, certainly, if I'm confirmed as Secretary of Defense, I'll make sure that we're living up to our commitments to uh, support. Uh, Taiwan's ability to defend itself. All right. Thank you, General Austin. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Scott. Senator Manchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, General. Appreciate very much your service, your family's dedication, commitment to our country, sir. Uh, the seven years, the seven-year cooling off period. You have five years. You've been in private in, in the private sector. What do you think could be accomplished in two more years? What are we missing there? I mean, I think that you've you segue pretty well into the private sector and understand the balance there. Well, I, I uh, 
you know, it's, certainly I'll be two years older, but uh, <laughs> but certainly I, I don't think I'll be I'll have any, any more change. commitment uh, to serving as a civilian than I have now. Just from history, people know that it used to be 10 years and we changed it uh, to seven years. We should be looking at the quality of the person the time we need him. Uh, Senator Manchin, I absolutely agree. It is about what's in the mind and the heart of the person that's being asked to serve. And, and, uh, and I, I certainly agree with you on that. The strength of our military and the admiration the whole world has for it has been because of the separation of, of, and led by the private sector and have the knowledge you have and being able to come from the private sector now I think it's going to be a great asset. There's other people in that uh, cooling off period down the chain. Do you, inf do you see any need to have any waivers for those? Because I think it's a much smaller waiver. Most of it's 180 days. People don't understand that either. It's, just, it's a very short period of time, but yet the person we need to lead it. I, 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 uh, we, we've not yet completely fleshed out, uh, you know, who would be serving in key positions. But if there's talent there that uh, that's a China expert or, or something else that we really need, I, I think, you know, it's important to, you know, to kind of yeah, weigh that out and make sure that, you know, we... We're focused on the right thing. Well, I know you'll get the right people. A couple of things. People have been asking me ever since I, I just came in today about tomorrow's security. Right now, there's been 12 guardsmen that have been relieved from the detail. And you talked about an experience you had when you, in, your, in your earlier life in the military. What, what do you see? I mean, it's, 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 it's a concern that I have now more so than ever before. And more people, we never realized it. But now we're seeing that all the, the, the conspiracy theories and all the different people are on the dark web or wherever they are, are being recruited that have military experience. What can we do and how should we approach this? Well, I think we can do uh, a better job of, uh, of screening our, you know, the folks that we bring in, the people that we bring in. Uh, I also think we need to do a, a better job of once we have people on board, that we that we're paying attention to them, that we understand that we're creating the right kind of environment for them to live uh, to live in, and that they are embracing the values that uh, that you know we think are important in the military and the values that are important for this country, uh, and uh, and I think this is a thing that we 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 have to work at day in and day out, uh, and and so. Um, Knowing, knowing the presence of what we have and what we're dealing with and what happened last week, how do you feel about the security we have for tomorrow? Well, I, I don't know the specifics of the moving parts. The Secret Service is, uh, I think, in charge of the overall effort. Uh, I think uh, I have every reason to believe that they will do a very credible job and provide for, uh, for uh, our security. Uh, I have confidence in, in uh, our guard. Uh, again, the fact that we are screening people and making sure that we don't have the, you know, the, the wrong kinds of people in the formation, I think, is, is a credit to their efforts. Well, you know that all the reports, we don't have all the evidence yet, or all the, uh, but we will have that probably during this next trial we have coming up, that the, the ball was dropped at the uh, Department of Defense, uh, that we didn't get the support we needed or the help we needed or the protection we needed quick enough. Uh, you know, I, I think that's uh, still under review, yes. Senator. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm not accusing until we see the facts, but yeah. that's been the reports coming out. So yeah. I know you have a lot of work ahead of you trying to build up that right. confidence level and the morale. If I can ask you the greatest threat that we face as a country, if, if you were going to name one of the greatest threats or the greatest challenge you think you're going to have coming in to this position, what would it be? Well, I think there are, there are a number of challenges, as we, as we discussed before. And quite frankly, the, the greatest challenge to our country right now, Senator Manchin, is the pandemic. It's killed, you know, over 400,000 of our American citizens, and uh, and that's that's just an incredible, incredible loss of life. Uh, I think we, you know, we have to do everything that we can to break the cycle of transmission and to and to begin to turn this thing around. I know that the president-elect is is very, very much focused on this. I think DOD can add uh, add value to this effort. Uh, and speed and scale, and, and I, I would certainly hope, you know, again, if I'm confirmed, one of the first things I'll do is take a look at how we're contributing and that there's more that we can do, and I believe that there probably will be, that will lean into this and, and help this effort uh, along. Uh, you know, in terms of um, 
other challenges. We talked about China. Mm -hmm. We talked about Russia. We talked about uh, pandemics. Uh, number one, oh, you think from the standpoint? China, China is uh, is the most uh, concerning. Yeah. Uh, competitor that uh, that we're facing. Let me ask you this about finances. John McCain, the late John McCain, my dear friend, and uh, we all knew John pretty well. If you work with John, you knew John pretty well. He made sure of that. But John and I had a bill that we always worked on auditing the Pentagon, aud auditing the Department of Defense. It's the only, it was the only agency in all, of, all the government was never audited. But they've been doing a good job, but there's still a little bit of a lax there. I just would like for your commitment on that to do everything you can to make sure that the finances, the people know how we're investing their money and what type of return we're getting on that. You have my commitment, Senator. Yeah. And let me just say this, sir. I truly believe with all my heart you're the right person at the right time to do this job because it's a tremendous undertaking. And I think to restore the confidence back to the American people that our Defense Department basically is there to defend us and is basically run by the civilians who basically are not going to make military or let military be used against us at any time. And what we saw last Wednesday was an anomaly that will never happen again. But I thank you, sir. I look forward to voting for you. I look forward to working with you, Senator, if I'm confirmed. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thank you, Senator Manchin. And now via WebEx, Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this and the opportunity to uh, talk with General Austin. And I will say, General, I enjoyed our conversation yesterday so much. Uh, Thank you very much for your time and thank you to your family for sticking with you as you go through this process. I will say, and we discuss this, I'm one of those who is not in, in favor of waivers. I believe that rules are and processes are put in place over time because of specific reasons. With that said, however, you and I do have mutual friends, and they have all spoken to your strength of character, the way that you fulfill your role, uh, the work that you did with the military, and the leadership that you bring to different situations, and I thank you for, um, for that. I do want to go back to the topic we discussed, uh, the issue of China. And we talked about a quote that is attributed to you about strategic patience. And uh, you had applied that to China. And I, you thought it was an attribution or mentioned it was an attribution in the article. But I went back and looked at this, and it was a quote from an interview, and thus later picked up by Asia Today or Asia, Asia Times and other foreign policy articles. And as you have heard from other members on the committee, China, and I think you also believe China and great power competition is our greatest threat. Whether we are looking at what is happening on the economic side, and I appreciate you mentioned that earlier, because we discussed, we don't know exactly where MOFCOM ends or where their economic sector ends and their military sector begins. So. What I'd like for you to do is spend a minute and talk about why you cannot use strategic patience with China and why it is an imperative that we address the economic and the military side of that China problem coin, if you will, and how your budget priorities are going to reflect the desire to deal with China, to work with Taiwan, uh, to to work with Hong Kong. So if you would take a, a minute and just address that for us. No, I, I think uh, over the last two decades, Senator, as we've been focused on, on necessarily focused on issues in the Middle East, China, we've seen China uh, modernize its military. We've seen its, uh, uh, we've seen it employ aggressive uh, in, in some cases, coerc coercive behavior against our allies in the region. Uh, we've seen it uh, do a number of things that, that tend to make us believe that China really wants to be the preeminent po uh, power in the world in the, in the uh, not too distant future. I think, uh, you know, again, China uh, looks to compete with us against, against uh, lo looks to compete with us in a number of areas across the spectrum. Uh, that includes, as you pointed out, uh, you know, uh, economics, uh, cyber, uh, uh, 
competition in, in the domain of space. Uh, so China, because of its desires, because, because of its worldview, is clearly a competitor that, that we have to make sure that, that uh, we, we begin to check their aggression. It will require a whole of government effort to do that. The Department of Defense's uh, piece in this is to make sure that we are presenting a credible deterrent to China so that uh, it will think twice before it, it decides to take on the United States of America, uh, China or any other aggressor. And that requires investment in a number of areas. We talked about this uh, a bit before. Yeah. You know, we, in, in modernization, things like AI and, and space-based platforms and directed energy and, and, uh, and just a number of things. If we are called upon to conduct operations uh, against a near peer such as China or Russia, it's a different type of engagement. And we need different capabilities. We need the operational concepts uh, that can employ those capabilities. Uh, and again, as I said earlier, we'll be required to understand what's going on on the battlefield much better, much faster, and be able to decide very uh, a lot quicker and then be able to act a lot quicker. Well, I appreciate that. And I think it's important for the record to reflect that you do not view dealing with China as a strategic patience. Uh, it's a different approach than we had um, with ISIS. Let me move on. We also talked a little bit about workforce and utilization of the guard as we look at some of the skill sets that are necessary moving into 5G deployment, a utilization of artificial intelligence, building out ISR, and some of those areas. So for the record, make a comment about guard recruitment, retention, and how you would uh, interface the guard with the active duty men and women. Well, we, we certainly have a great talent in our guardsmen, and that we've seen that uh, uh, on display uh, throughout these years of conflict that we've been in. Uh, our Guard has performed uh, very, very well. Uh, many of our Guardsmen have, have skills that, uh, that you don't typically find uh, in a normal unit or a normal organization. I, and so I think uh, in, in a lot of cases we can do a better job of leveraging those skills, uh, those unique skill sets, uh, to, to help our efforts in, in things like IT and, and other things. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we appreciate your service. We appreciate your time today. And Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for, for the hearing. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Now via WebEx, Senator Peters. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And uh, General Austin, I want to say uh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your service over many, many years uh, to this uh, country. And thank you for your willingness uh, to take on uh, this job. Uh, clearly, we are in an incredibly uh, difficult time in our history, and we're facing significant challenges, and your willingness uh, to serve your country once again uh, is commendable, commendable. So thank you. I, uh, I want to uh, pick up uh, briefly on some comments uh, made by my colleague, Senator Heinrich. And I think it, you, although you answered his question, I think it's important for you to know that there are many of us on this uh, committee that are very concerned about uh, PFAS uh, contamination in military sites uh, across the country. Clearly, this is a bigger problem than just uh, military sites. We've got uh, PFAS uh, sites throughout the country. Michigan has been particularly hard hit uh, with uh, sites uh, containing this very toxic uh, chemical. In fact, I think of the 700 sites identified around the country, uh, roughly 200 of them are in Michigan, although we think uh, the reason that number is so high is just because we've been looking for it more than other states. It's likely to continue. But we do have military sites that have been impacted, and, uh, and one in particular in Michigan, which is uh, the former Wordsmith Air Force Base uh, in Oscoda. They have, the folks in Oscoda and that area have been dealing with this contamination for many years. Uh, they are, and rightly so, incredibly frustrated uh, by the slowness uh, from the Air Force and others to deal with it. We've started to see some pickup uh, in activity and cleanup, but they have waited uh, too long. And I know you made uh, a commitment to Senator Heinrich uh, to expedite this, but I, I want you to know that this is a major issue for me, for folks in Michigan, folks around Wordsmith Air Force Base, as well as 
uh, other military sites across the country. I'm sure many of my other colleagues would join in. And so uh, I, uh, I hope that you are indeed uh, committed uh, to making sure we do right by these communities that have hosted uh, these bases for years and are now suffering uh, the consequences. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything to what uh, your response was to Senator Heinrich, uh, but please know this is a, a serious issue for us across the country. No, I, I am committed, uh, Senator. I think, as I said earlier, the, the health and welfare of our military members, our families, our DOD civilians, and our communities uh, is, is very, very important. And uh, again, uh, Secretary Esper stood up a PFAS task force. I'll, uh, I'll check in with them and make sure that I expedite their work, if at all possible. And, and uh, and certainly I look forward to working with my EPA counterpart uh, on this issue. I think it's, uh, it's very, very important to mitigate the effects of these contaminants uh, as, as soon as we can. I, well, you, you can look for us to stay committed to that. I appreciate that, General. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, you mentioned it in a number of questions about the changing nature of warfare, and we are, we're on the cusp of major changes as a result of technology. You alluded to some in the last uh, answer whether it's uh, AI, uh, automation, directed weapons. Uh, we just know that we're in a technological revolution that will change uh, the way we live dramatically. And uh, when that happens, that also changes the, the face of warfare in dramatic uh, ways. Uh, and uh, it's not just the, the complexity of our tools, but as you mentioned, it's uh, the strategic and operational environment as well. And so it's going to require uh, some really uh, some creative thinking uh, outside of normal uh, uh, policies uh, in how we prepare for this, uh, this change. And I think a lot of uh, that requires changing some of the culture, particularly when you just have a large bureaucratic organization like the Department of Defense. It's no different than any other large bureaucratic organization. It's sometimes difficult to get out of uh, the established mindsets and understand that things are changing rapidly. And so, you know, guidance from the top uh, is incredibly important. And that means, in my mind, and I'd love to have your thoughts, that means placing a premium on uh, digital skills by expanding uh, eligibility for billets uh, in the Joint Artificial uh, Intelligence Center, for example, Defense uh, Innovation Unit, uh, and their service level uh, equivalents, both inside uh, as well as outside the department. So, General, if you could give me a sense of, of how do you assess the ability, for example, of Defense uh, Innovation Offices to develop systems that are going to be able to enhance both our performance and our effectiveness. And if, if you could, as you're thinking of this and, and answering this question, uh, uh, mention in particular uh, how this will be helpful as we start operating perhaps more be, uh, below the threshold of armed conflict, uh, which may likely be uh, an emerging pattern that we have to deal with uh, more often than we'd like. Yeah, so I, I think it's really important that we have the ability to develop the, the kinds of uh, capabilities that you just described, Senator. Uh, you asked specifically about, uh, about the people that, uh, that we have that are dedicated to and working on these, on these issues and whether or not it's, uh, you know, we're managing, managing, managing them the right way. Um, something that I'll have to look at, I'll have to go in and talk to the leadership about you know what their needs are, and and, uh, and you know how we can improve our efforts right now. Uh, and I look forward to that conversation. But uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on on that issue uh, right now. But but I, I really believe that what you what you just said is is absolutely important. Uh, you know we've got to be able to develop the uh, the ability to uh, to move things with the with the uh, appropriate speed and focus that will enable us to be relevant uh, going forward. And, and I think part of that speed, and uh, there have been several questions related to the procurement process, is a lot of this innovation in the past would take place within the Department of Defense. Now we're seeing a lot of this innovation in commercial markets uh, and in the commercial sector. But as you integrate that and having uh, era centers or innovation centers that work with those commercial centers, I think are incredibly important. Now I'm happy to say in Michigan, we have our ground vehicle system center that takes advantage of the auto industry and some of uh, the developments we're seeing uh, in, in automation. Uh, I, uh, would you commit to continuing to invest in those kinds of programs that work uh, with, in partnership uh, with advanced uh, innovation in the commercial sector? I think automation is really important to us. You've, you've heard a number of leaders talk about that. And uh, I think 
you know, we're going to, uh, th that'll be an area of focus for us going forward. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it, General. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, via WebEx, Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General, for being here, and congratulations on your nomination. It's always nice to see a uh, graduate of Webster University in St. Louis up before the committee, so uh, congratulations uh, on that as well. Let me uh, come back to something you said at the very beginning of uh, your testimony during your, your, uh, your, your statement uh, at the beginning. You said that China is a pacing threat, a pacing threat. I just want to be clear, are there other pacing threats and what would they be? Now, China is the most significant uh, uh, competitor that we're focused on. It is the pacing threat. Uh, on that, thank you for that. That's a helpful clarification. On that same uh, point, you're going to have uh, the opportunity here to oversee the next national defense strategy. Uh, you have said, and other committee members have quoted this today, you've talked about uh, the competition, the strategic competition with China and Russia. You've also said today, though, several times, including to me just now, that you think that China is the pacing threat, that China is the top priority. So can you commit to us that as you oversee the next NDS, that China will be unequivocally identified as, as the top challenge threat competitor of the United States? Now, clearly, the, the strategy will be arrayed against the threat, and, uh, and China is, uh, is, presents the, the most significant threat going forward because China is ascending. Russia is also a threat, but it's, uh, it's in, in decline. Uh, it can still do a, a great deal of damage, as, we, as we've seen here uh, in recent days, in, in an area, and in, in it's a country that we have to remain, uh, maintain some degree of focus on, but China is the pacing threat. Very good, and you would expect, just to press my point here, but you would, you would expect to see that uh, identified uh, China that is identified as, as the facing threat in the, national, in the next national defense strategy. In other words, you don't see any reason why that would not be the case. Is that correct? Uh, that, you know, that, that follows. That makes sense, Senator Hawley. Uh, I think, uh, but again, uh, we, I certainly don't want to try to write the strategy here. Uh, we want to make sure we go through the process of, of, of arraying the threats and, and identifying what, the, you know, what capabilities we, we're going to place against them. But it, it certainly follows... Uh, it is the pacing th uh, issue, the pacing threat uh, currently, and I fully expect that it will remain uh, so going forward. Good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pressing on, on it only because I think there has been some confusion uh, with the last national defense strategy, the way it has been interpreted in some quarters to put China and Russia on a plane. What you just said just a second ago, I think, is very encouraging that China is the pacing threat. Russia, of course, is a threat. There's no doubt about that. But uh, to your to your words, it is in decline, and and of course we have we have limited resources and capacities, and we're going to have to make sure that those limited resources and capacities are deployed, uh, correspondent and uh, corresponding to the, the relevant threat. So I'm I'm encouraged by what you said. I'm going to hold you to that. Let me shift to Taiwan, which is uh, obviously closely related. Let me follow up on something Senator Scott asked you about under the Taiwan Relations Act. The United States is committed to maintaining the capacity to resist any resort to force or other forms of coercion that would jeopardize the security of the people of Taiwan. Uh, given our obligations under that statute, General, do you agree that DOD should maintain the ability to deter a Chinese fait accompli when it comes to Taiwan? Senator, you, you came in broken on that last piece there. If, if, I, if I could ask you to repeat the, the end of that, please. Yeah, when it comes to Taiwan, General, do you agree that the Department of Defense should clearly prioritize defeating a fait accompli scenario in Taiwan on the part of China, an attempt to invade, exert pressure that would put us in a fait accompli scenario? Should that be our top priority? Well, certainly, you know, I don't want to go down a road of getting into hypotheticals about, uh, you know, what we would do if. Uh, certain things happen. I would just say that my, my job as a, the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, if, if confirmed, is to present credible options to uh, the President to ensure that we can protect our interests uh, and, uh, and defend ourselves. And, you know, 
one of our interests is to make sure that uh, Taiwan, uh, and, uh, and a commitment is to make sure that Taiwan has the ability uh, to, to defend itself. Uh, and so we'll stay committed to that going forward. Yeah, I, and I certainly appreciate the fact that you can't anticipate all threats uh, going forward. However, we do have to plan. And to go back to points you've made about husbanding our scarce resources, making sure that we're using them well, we've got to identify the scenarios that we're prioritizing to plan for. And so I just want to say, ask one more time, with regard to the fait accompli scenario in Taiwan, uh, which is identified, of course, in the in the current the 2018 National Defense Strategy, is that a scenario you think we ought to prioritize uh, in our planning purposes in order to deter China? Uh, again, you know, we're, we're committed. We've been committed to the support of uh, Taiwan throughout, and uh, and again, it's been bipartisan support. We we will remain committed to uh, supporting Taiwan, and uh, and so. Uh, We'll have the right options available to protect our interests and, and to defend ourselves. Let me uh, shift to Afghanistan here briefly, General, in the time I've, I've got remaining. Uh, if the Taliban violates its part of the peace agreement, there's going to be significant pressure on the president-elect to send thousands of troops back into Afghanistan and uh, perpetuate the cycle that we have seen there. How do you think we should respond if the Taliban violates our peace agreement so that we can achieve our counterterrorism objectives without increasing the number of troops that we have there in the region. Uh, Senator, you know that we are currently operating as a part of a coalition effort uh, there in Afghanistan. And uh, what I've heard General Milley and General Miller say publicly is that they believe they have uh, adequate resources to, to accomplish the objectives uh, that are that they're assigned currently. Uh, and so if I'm confirmed as I go in, I'd like to be able to assess the situation myself and, uh, and then make my uh, recommendations to the president in terms of, you know, what's required uh, and, and what's not required. I see my time's expired. Thank you again, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. And finally, we now have via WebEx, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I spoke in this committee last week about my concerns with making exceptions to allow any person to serve as Secretary of Defense less than seven years after leaving regular military service. Mr. Austin, you and I spoke about this issue on our recent call as well. I want to reiterate that my concerns are the same now as they were when we considered Secretary Mattis' nomination four years ago. My vote against a waiver that would allow you to serve as Secretary of Defense has everything to do with restoring the bedrock principle of civilian control of the military and nothing to do with you, your qualifications, or your character. Last week, I pledged to my colleagues that if they choose to pass an exception to statute, I will consider your nomination fairly and on its merits. Mr. Austin, I make that same promise to you today. Based on our call last week, in fact, I feel we are aligned in our thoughts on a number of the most urgent national security issues facing our country. I'm pleased to get the chance now to follow up on a few of those challenges that I believe the DOD is facing that concerns me the most. First, I've raised alarms before about President Trump's total disregard for good order and discipline. Over the last four years, he has valorized ruthless killing and pardoned war criminals like convicted former CEO Eddie Gallagher. He directly undermined leaders like former Naval Special Warfare Commander Admiral Green, who attempted to hold service members accountable when they violated their oaths and failed to uphold good order and discipline. And in some communities, like the CEO community, were already struggling with service members drifting from their core values, likely due to the stress of 19 years of war and deployments. President Trump's rhetoric has damaged attempts to restore discipline in our Department of Defense. Now, in the fallout of violent insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, we're starting to learn the depths of the problem in our military services. Veterans, active duty troops, members of the National Guard have already been found to have participated in an actual attack on elected leaders and our constitutional process in direct violation of their oaths of office. We've seen significant reporting on the ways that extremist groups specifically target military members and veterans, and it's likely that we'll discover more in the coming weeks. Mr. Austin, it's clear that we are at a crisis point. 
We need strong leadership to root out extremists in the military and reaffirm the core values that have defined military service. If confirmed, what steps would you take to assert your leadership, set the example for the service chiefs, and reinstate good order and discipline? Well, the activity that, uh, that we've seen recently in terms of uh, you know, potential racist or extremist behavior within our ranks is, in my view, uh, absolutely unacceptable. And I think you've, you've heard the chiefs, uh, service chiefs, and the chairman uh, recently speak to that as well. Uh, I'll, I'll work uh, with the leaders of the de of various departments to make sure that it is absolutely clear uh, to everyone uh, in the department, uh, military or civilian, that this is behavior that does not uh, um, does not fit our values, does not comport with our values. And so uh, I will want the, uh, uh, the leaders of all of the uh, services and all the departments to make sure that they're doing the right things to set the right example uh, and to create the right climate uh, that discourages and eliminates uh, that, that type of behavior. And this is not something that we can be passive on. This is something I think we have to be active on and we have to lean into it and make sure that, uh, that we're, we're doing the right things uh, to create the right climates. And there needs to be consequences for bad actors as well. Uh, uh, certainly, if, if someone is, uh, is accused and, and an investigation uh, determines that uh, that person is, uh, is guilty of, of that type of behavior, then we'll take the appropriate actions. Thank you. Mr. Austin, you oversaw one of the, our military's largest and most complex logistics operations in Iraq, so you understand better than most, almost anyone else. Going forward, we can't rely on the same logistics system and practices that we use in Iraq and Afghanistan as we look to future uh, uh, potential areas of conflict. Great power competition demands that we innovate our approach to logistics. And so it is critical that we invest in Transcom and ensure that logistics-related planning factors are central to our op plans and our major exercises. If confirmed, what initiatives will you prioritize to ensure that Transportation Command and the rest of the DOD's logistics enterprise is modernized and resourced to support global operations and to withstand threats from peer competitors, especially when we're talking about in contested environments? No, I, I think, Senator, uh, you're absolutely correct. You know, our, our logistics capabilities uh, really enable us to do the great work that we've done around the globe. Uh, I, I think uh, we have to continue to invest uh, in the right things. I, I look forward to having a conversation with, uh, with our senior logistics uh, uh, leaders in, in, in in all of the branches and, 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 the, and also in, in the uh, department as well. Uh, and I, I want to invest in those types of things that, uh, that, can, that, that can provide us innovative approaches to uh, delivering the types of logistics that we'll need to sustain ourselves. Uh, I, I agree with you that uh, we won't be able to do business as we've always done it uh, going forward as we're looking to compete with uh, a near peer competitor. Thank you. The DOD is also well positioned to lead the way on developing the kind of clean energy technology that can accelerate our fight against climate change, one of the biggest national security threats of our time, and reduce the military's reliance on fossil fuel, which would shorten that logistics tail. If confirmed, how would you lead DOD to reduce its emissions and develop the sort of breakthrough energy technology that can make forward deployed troops less reliant on fuel delivery and other energy related sustainment? Well, I think while we're, you know, we are no doubt doing some things on all of our installations now to, uh, to reduce our energy uh, consumption and reduce our, our carbon footprint, I think there's more that we can do. Um, you know, we, we consume a lot of energy, and so I think that, you know, we, we can have a substantial impact if we're, we're focused on the right things. Um, you know, it, this affects us in a lot of ways. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, if we look at, you know, utilization of, uh, you know, on installations and in, in other capacity, utilization of, uh, 
electrical vehicles and you know reducing the amount of energy that, that we're consuming uh, and just a number of other things you know we, we can make a pretty substantial impact on our overall effort here and so I look forward to working with the administration and my colleagues uh, and working with the department uh, to really improve our performance thus far I'll appoint a uh, uh, a specific person on my staff uh, to help me focus on this issue and to coordinate uh, uh, issues uh, within the department and within the services as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm over time, Mr. Chairman. Okay, do we have any more? All right, I've been told that this completes our members that were that were wanting to participate, and we want to thank you very much, uh, General Austin, for the time you've uh, given us, and we look forward to working with you. Senator uh, Reed, did you want to make any further comments? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, no, I just want to thank you for conducting this hearing and thank General Austin uh, for participating, and uh, good luck, sir. Thank you, Senator Reed. And when we meet again two days from now, I think you will be the chairman, I'll be the ranking member. That transition will take place very peaceably, and I will tell you how we have enjoyed working together for a number of years, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's been an honor and a great pleasure working with you, and I think uh, with your leadership, we've accomplished a great deal, and I thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, General Austin, did you have any other any questions that were not asked that you'd like to volunteer answers to now? I think the answer is no. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank you and the committee members for allowing me the time this afternoon to uh, uh, to engage with you. And I want to thank you all also for the tremendous support that you've given to our, our military over the years. And if confirmed, I look forward to uh, working with you uh, and, uh, uh, and doing the same kinds of things that you've done in the past. Again, thanks. That's good. Thank you very much. And we are adjourned.